The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line.
The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line.
The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you. Welcome to the Westminster City Council meeting of February the 8th, 2021. At the beginning of each meeting, we take the Pledge of Allegiance, so I will ask you, all of those who are able, to please join us at this time in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you Ms. parker at this time would you take the roll please certainly mayor atchison here councillor demont present mayor pro tem sites here councillor seymour here Councillor Scully. Here. Councillor Smith. Present. And Councillor Bowles. Here. All right, thank you, Council. On, moving on to our next item on the agenda is the consideration of the minutes of the January 25th meeting. If someone would like to make the motion, we'll get started. Ms. Scully, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve the minutes of the January 25th, 2021 meeting as presented. Councilor Smith. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved. Moving on to item four, presentations. We have none scheduled for tonight. Uh, Ms. Parker, just confirming the public comments that we have are all associated to the public hearing later on in the agenda. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as of the deadline, we did not receive any requests to speak live, nor were any voicemails um, received um, that were just for public comment. Okay, thank you much. We'll move on to item six. Mr. Tripp, report of city officials, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to uh, do a couple things this evening. First of all, I want to recognize on behalf of uh, your workforce uh, that this is Black History Month and that there are some activities that are going on in the city related to Black History Month. <clears throat> we are we're blessed in Colorado and throughout this country to have a number of Black men and women who have played very significant parts uh, in our history. Uh, I've been fortunate through my career um, to work with a number of people and work on uh, a number of different programs and projects um, to, uh, to assist our communities in being more inclusive. And I'm proud here tonight to talk about some of the things that we're doing for Black History Month. We have the capability at City Hall through some LED lighting that's available to, uh, to face front that building at no additional cost to the city uh, for different types of events. And we're We'll be, we have a building lit this month, uh, red, yellow, and green in recognition. Uh, we'll also have a banner across our website that'll be noting and referring to some programs that are going on this month. 
our library all does also always does a great job in recognizing some of these events uh, and important periods uh, during our year. Um, library book recommendations will be um, a recommendation program will feature books for Black History Month, and that'll begin on February 12th. Uh, the library will also be, be promoting digital content associated with Black History Month through the Libby app. Um, those of you who are library users will be familiar with the Libby app. It's a digital book and audio checkout system. If you want more information about that, call any of our public libraries here in Westminster. The above programs will be featured on our website. Uh, on a related note, we are really proud to share that progress is being made at the Armed Forces Tribute Garden, uh, and it relates to this conversation. One of the first six sculptures to complete the garden depicts uh, an African-American in the Merchant Marines. This is part of the city's commitment to diversity and to reshape the vision of the Air Force, the Armed Forces Tribute Garden, and showcase the diversity of our armed forces. So uh, with that this evening, I'd like the next turn uh, to Cody Erb, who is gonna to speak to you tonight about a subject that's actually related uh, to this. Um, she's been working on, as a special project, um, a program in our community uh, to, to support uh, our welcoming um, America's um, attitude and uh, uh, proclamation that we did several years ago uh, in the areas of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusivity. And uh, if I could call Cody on to join us, Cody had asked you to provide a little information for the council. Thanks very much. Thank you, City Manager Tripp. Uh, my name is Cody Blue Orb. I'm the assistant to the city manager, and I've been asked to give an update on two really important items. Um, Matt, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting up my slides, I'm just going to go over real brief the current status of the Westie Rise Recovery and Resiliency Community Advisory Work Group, as well as um, some of the DEI or diversity. Uh, equity and inclusivity issues that we've been working on um, as at the city as a whole, both in their workforce and in the community. So just as a refresher, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the greatest crises of our generation and recovery will require not only repair, but also innovation. The city manager has developed and executed a program that will engage over hundred community members and stakeholders to envision the near-term future of the city of Westminster and create a precise and actual recommendations across the following focus areas. I think you all have heard that before and probably seen this list, policy and economic stimulus, physical, mental, and emotional health, marketing and business development, diversity and inclusivity, data and technology, and sustainability. Many of these you also see in your vision statement and throughout the strategic plan. Um, I just wanna give a quick update, just a couple sentences on each group, and overall let you know that the teams have been meeting since very part early part of December, and they're coming up on their recommendation period. So by the end of this week, early next week, the teams will have formulated potential recommendations that they will make um, in about early to mid-March. And we'll talk about that more in a little minute in a minute. Uh, the policy and economic stimulus group is being headed up by Lori Goldstein. And the team currently has been interviewing. Uh, members of the community from Growing Home, uh, local businesses, and many of our residents. They're still working on paring down and finding, identifying the themes for what their recommendations might be. The group is actually just wrapped up their meeting about 30 minutes ago and are meeting again later this week. The physical, mental, and emotional health is being led by Wayne East. Um, that team is focusing around a number of ideas. They have five currently, and three of them um, focus on homelessness or food insecurities and that sort of work. Those will be pared down and um, streamlined again. And also, um, libraries, important part of that we overlook. Um, they wanna safely reopen libraries and then be able to keep them open uh, or at least accessible throughout this pandemic. So um, that, work is again coming to fruition and we'll see more of that in a few weeks the marketing and business development group also met earlier this evening they're connecting with the policy and economic stimulus group that group is being led by patty um, she the team has been whittled down there's only a couple of them still actively involved but they're pairing up nicely and reaching out to their colleagues and the other teams who are doing similar work and really branching out they hope to have some more ideas in the next week Diversity and inclusivity team is being led by Dolores Ramirez. 
um, they're really focused on accessibility for all community members in um, the city and in government and looking at opportunities in the context of the pandemic and where those opportunities are to really help the communities of color who are most vulnerable during this time and who will be in the months to come. The data and technology team is being led by Miguel Mendoza Hall. That team is looking at data as a strategy, how to create a strategy across the city to provide more data and consistent data uh, so that it's easier for decision making and for um, accessibility of the community to gather that and see the data. The sustainability team is being led by Jesse Lund. Uh, their focus is on air quality improvements and also reviewing the sustainability plan that you all saw recently with this new lens of the pandemic and seeing where the opportunities might be uh, in that, in this new future that we have ahead of us. Uh, overall, the teams are coming together. Their next workshop is scheduled actually for this Friday. It's their final workshop so that in the next two or three weeks, they'll have a set of recommendations. Staff will then provide those recommendations with a hope that they'll help to inform the 2021 strategic plan, as well as the budget priorities for this next year. Um, all right, Matt, next slide, please. In the way of diversity, equity, and inclusivity, uh, the city has been doing quite a bit. As you can imagine, there's also a lot of overlap here and the work that we're doing just in our regular every day. Currently, the city has uh, partnered with a group called CPS HR to do a workforce assessment because um, we're working toward being an organization that reflects the community and has pay equity. Um, so really embracing the opportunity and possibilities to be better as an organization uh, with our workforce, where those um, moments are that we can do better. Uh, regionally, we have a broad network. Martha Hines and HR has championed relationships with people across the community in other cities and in our counties. We're continuing to build those networks, learning from them and sharing resources and also providing what we have. Um, we have an equity action team that is an internal grassroots employee-based team that is working on creating a space for resources and shared information across the organization for those who are interested or curious or have questions or want to have conversations. The goal here is to really bring awareness to the issues of diversity, equity, inclusivity, and um, what a lens and equity lens looks like in our work. The language access plan, which has been part of our work for a number of years now, is being re-energized. We have a refreshed staff team and um, are currently diligent work, diligently working on updating documents and resources, providing and developing training, and then ultimately working not only to be accessible, but also welcoming to other to the community as a whole. Um, Westy Ray's recovery and resiliency, you've seen that work. Um, and the slide ahead, Community Rise is our neighborhood specific initiative. And although that's been paused because our uh, pandemic numbers had increased, there's still work being done there, um, both community wide and, um, and neighborhood specific. So we have uh, the Mong Community Garden is one of the current projects that's um, still in discussion and meeting and that sort of thing. Westminster Public Schools, um, Historic Westminster, all have plans either underway or in development. And then the Inclusivity Board, who you hear about on a monthly basis from Councillor DeMott, um, but also many of you have recently participated in their meetings and know what they're doing. Um, we're currently helping them look at the Human Rights Campaign Municipal Equity Index. Um, per their request, that Equity Action Team is actually taking that on as subcommittee of the group. Um, the Welcoming America standard, which was part of the Welcoming Communities, uh, Welcoming America communities that we participated in beginning in 2016, I believe. We did an assessment at that time, revised it in 2018, and are now looking at it again in this new context. Additionally, the Inclusivity Board has um, taken on the initiative of providing resources and being accessible to the community, not just as inclusivity board, which is an advisory board to the council, but also looking at other ways that they can be actively engaged in the community and 
um, provide more information. So we're working on identifying those items and then getting those included on their web page. So that is all I have for you this evening. Um, looks like there's some questions, perhaps. I don't see any at this point, Cody. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if you'd like any follow-up, please let me know. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tripp, you have anything else? No, I don't. Thanks very much for the ability to share some of this information with you. Uh, um, I think it's good information for you and the community and the staff appreciates the opportunity to present. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Let me turn to the council, see if there's any comments the council has on their activities from the past week. Councilor Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to thank the <clears throat> Westminster Rise Recovery Resilience group of people who are working on that project, all of the volunteers from our community, as well as our staff. Um, <clears throat> it's important work, and I appreciate your time and effort that has been dedicated to that. Um, this last week, I had um, two meetings. I had one on Thursday night with the Parks, Recreation, Libraries, Open Space group. Um, they have a lot that they are working on, and so they will be um, probably moving to a meeting every month rather than every other month. Um, definitely, we will have, we had a meeting in January. We have one, we had one in February. We'll have another one in March for sure. And then um, they are looking at potentially continuing the trend of meeting every month. Um, they talked about the big dry creek and scepter um, sewer and um, where it is located and how that project is moving forward and why it is an important project. Um, and I want to reach out to Kent Brugler, um, Joe Rail, and John Vaughn, who did a great job presenting to our to that committee. And then um, they talked about the parkland dedication and um, park fees that are associated with that. They also talked about the promenade and reimagining the pond. Um, for those of you who don't know, the pond is leaking um, about 7,000 gallons of water a day. And so it's really important that we get in there and get that fixed and um, reimagine it. Um, so appreciated that conversation. They talked about the neighborhood grant um, that is currently available for um, neighborhoods that would like to um, reimagine their landscaping and their water usage and opportunities to um, just, you know, redesign a little bit. Um, that grant is up on the website and available. Um, talked about a uh, little bit about libraries and communication. Um, had a long discussion about the um, Hills Open Space and Dog Park. Um, there is a study currently going on and they are looking at adding parking and um, how they can make that area more accessible but um, better controlled of um, how many people are out there. There's a lot of visitors and there, there's a lot of um, people parking in interesting places and so we need to um, reevaluate that space and how we're going to imagine it in the future. Um, they talked about the FLAP grant and um, that was pretty much it. And then today, I had the opportunity of um, attending the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport Roundtable meeting. We're still very much in structuring that roundtable, um, although I think we wrapped it up pretty well today, and so we should begin active conversations in March. Um, we voted um, to make sure that we have public comment every single meeting. Um, there was a question of whether we would do it every meeting or every quarter, we decided that every meeting was better. We wanted to make sure we're hearing from the residents. Uh, Mark Lasis and Jeff Lipton were voted in as the chair and the vice chair. We had several people today who did offer public comment. We um, voted to employ the Primacy Strategy Group as our facilitator, and we will be meeting on the second Monday from 9 to 11 um, from this date forward. Um, we had an update from Director Paul Lanzo. And um, he gave us a very nice presentation on the operations of the airport, um, verifying that yes, um, the operations of the airport can be very seasonal. They can also be very dependent on the days of the week um, and weekends, um, but that yes, operations in general are up. And um, so we, we do have some conversations to have. Um, approximately 189,000 flights um, go through 
that airport. It is the third busiest airport in our state, only, sec only third to DIA and Centennial. Um, in the future, we'll be having a briefing from the FAA. Um, we'll be talking about background, about landing fees, um, talking about the noise complaints, monitoring and studies, and talking about future development um, for the airport. So that is my report. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Science. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Councillor Scully, for that report. Um, I also would just want to take a moment and say thank you um, to Cody Erb for her report earlier. Um, I found that really interesting and helpful um, and timely. Um, we all know that COVID has really magnified um, equity issues um, across the state, across the nation, and in our community. Um, so it was really heartening to see all of the work that we're doing. So we don't just talk about inclusivity as a platitude, but the actionable um, items that the city and our residents are, are going through to try to improve. So thank you for that. Um, in regards to the Westminster Rise, um, that was a wonderful update. I was happy to see how it, the, the six different areas that you broke out and that information will definitely be um, interesting for us. So thank you. Um, I also wanna say thank you to city staff for acknowledging Black History Month. Um, making sure that we, um, as a community, celebrate Black history is American history. There's wonderful um, information for us to learn, so I appreciate that we're, we're supporting that. Um, I had two meetings last week, um, the first of which um, I was just, um, as an alternate, I went to the Dr. Cog board session. Um, most of the conversation was around um, kind of a, a staff proposal, to have a staff proposal to um, update Metro Vision to match some of the changes that are going on with RTD's planning due to reimagine RTD. Um, and so that was a great conversation. The approach was um, liked by the members, um, the, the actual members. Um, and so that'll be going forward, I believe, for the full board meeting um, later this month. Um, and then the next uh, meeting that I had was with Colorado Communities for Climate Action. Um, we have a lot of new members in that group. There are 35 local governments now um, across the state, so that's wonderful. Um, one of the newest members is our neighbor or our partner, Adams County. Um, so it's, it's quite a diverse group um, throughout the state that are now working together for um, asking for state climate action so that local governments um, don't disproportionately bear the, the costs of climate inaction. Um, it was a hard meeting. <laughs> um, we did the normal stuff going through the budget. We talked about the policy um, process, what that's going to look like with such a large group um, in the coming years. I think Councillor Smith is going to be really busy because they're going to lean on that policy group um, even more um, for updating our policy statements. Um, but one of the original members and just a really great person um, was one of the gentlemen who was caught in the avalanche last week. Um, Adam Palmer was a trustee um, for the town of Eagle, um, but he was also um, the director of sustainability for Eagle County. Um, I had the privilege to know him and work with him, and uh, he was simply incredible in every sense of the word. Kind, humble, humorous, funny, sly, um, and just dogged in his desire to make the world a better place um, than he found it. And that was from being a good neighbor to also serving on the Holy Cross um, board. And they have just a few months ago announced that they will be 100% renewable um, by 2030. Um, really a huge loss, loss for our state, um, for CC4CA, um, but for the, the town of Eagle, um, the mayor pro tem of that town was also in the avalanche. Andy um, has also passed. Um, so I would ask us to hold them in our hearts um, and think how we can support our neighbors and that municipality, well, not our neighbors, but our friends um, in the municipality of Eagle. Um, they lost three community leaders all in local government, um, all leaders in sustainability. Um, it has made me really committed to doing what I can to be the best um, member and leader in this community that I can be, because um, all three of these people have, have a huge legacy in the short lives they lived. Um, that said, I'm asking each member of our community, 
please um, give your feedback on our draft sustainability plan. Um, it's really important. This is how we, it's our roadmap to making sure that we're a community that has a thriving local economy that has um, inclusive, safe neighborhoods um, where we're stewards of our environment um, now and in the future. Um, there is a draft, it's um, up on our website. Um, we are taking notes and comments on it until February 11th. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask um, really um, in, in memory of Adam, this is an area that was a passion of his. I'm gonna try to really do a push for people to, to, to weigh in. So thank you so much, apologize for rambling. Um, have a good night and hug your loved ones. Councillor Volz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I surprisingly didn't go to any meetings this last week on behalf of City Council, which is, I think, a first. But I do want to just briefly uh, commend Cody Er her report tonight. She did on our Westie Rise activities. Uh, it was an outstanding report. It really was uplifting and inspiring to hear what all is going on. And I want to thank her for that report. And it was well delivered. So. I also want to thank our Westie Rise community volunteers for their activity. You know, they're volunteering to do this. Thank you, and we appreciate it. Um, and then I also want to say on the diversity, equity, inclusivity portion of Westie Rise, to me, this demonstrates, it really demonstrates the heart of our community, the heart of our city, what we do to help those who can't help themselves possibly, or those who are discriminated against, what we come together and what we do as a city to protect those, those people and make everyone feel um, part of our city and that they can participate. So I really respect the work here and I, I wanna thank Cody Erb and the Westy Rise volunteers and everybody working on this project and, uh, and, and city staff as well. So thank you for that. I think it's very important to the, uh, like I said, the heart of our city. So thank you for that. And then let's just one last thing, come together and celebrate Black History Month throughout February. So thank you and uh, let's have a good meeting. Councilor DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to share a couple of events that are coming up or opportunities for people to engage in some of the things you heard about tonight. So this Wednesday, February 10th at six o'clock, you can join the Inclusivity Board. Um, on the 17th, you have an opportunity that there's the Environmental Advisory Board, and then on the 17th as well, there's Special Permits and Licensing Board. You can always hear about how you can attend these meetings on cityofwestminster.us. I know that you often hear us talk about these different groups who uh, are citizen groups that are picked by council who do a lot of good work that help drive the policy in the city and a lot of the good things that you've heard about tonight, especially around inclusivity. So I would encourage people, if you're listening tonight, to to join us on those meetings. I'll be on the, I'm the liaison to inclusivity this Wednesday. A lot of good stuff happening. So great opportunities for people to be involved. Some of the other things that you might see on our website are some of the good things that our parks um, and rec are doing with the libraries, um, such as this Saturday, there's a share the love on Zoom. So if you're looking for something to do from home with your family, there's a lot of good opportunities that you can find on our website um, and be able to engage. Councilor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I attended the Historic Landmark Board on Thursday, February 4th, and a lot of it was administrative in their meeting to discuss the Historic Marker Program. Uh, there are several that haven't been placed in the city, whether that's public or city owned or privately owned. So they were discussing about how to mark those areas and make sure that everything that is, is designated historic moves forward with those placards. Uh, and then it was nice to see our newly uh, appointed board members to the Historic Landmark Board uh, in that meeting. Other than that, uh, their next scheduled meeting is April 28th of this year at 7 p.m. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the members of the council? All right, I have one update for you uh, in this regard. As you know, we are, we're in a situation where we're still trying to get vaccines and vaccinations done as quickly as possible. And then this week, we start a new round of adding more people to the eligibility of the 65 to 69. We're moving into those groups. But I have a message here from Daphne David, the CEO of North Suburban. I'll read it to you so I don't uh, mess it up. 
We continue to work with the state on a daily basis to request additional vaccines. However, it's been a challenge to accommodate the needs of our community when the supply falls short of the demand. Given the limited supply of COVID-19 vaccines, the vaccine for ages 70 plus are being distributed by appointment only at North Suburban Medical Center located in Thornton. We will continue to grow and expand these clinics in the future as we get additional vaccine supplies. The week of February 8th, following state guidelines, we'll begin vaccinating those 65 to 69, as well as others who will become eligible according to the state's tiers with the resources provided to us. The link to register for the COVID vaccine is healthonecares.com forward slash vaccine. For those who have access to email or need additional assistance, they have a phone number listed for you at 303-453-2477. Again, this starts this week, today, 65 and up are eligible. You can register again at healthonecares.com forward slash vaccine or call 303-453-2477. Seeing no other business at this point on this item, we will move on to the consent agenda. There is only one item on the consent agenda, and if it's need to, we will remove it from the consent agenda if there's an, a request from council. All right, seeing none, Councilor Seymour. Go ahead with the motion if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to adopt the consent agenda eight, item 8A. Okay. All of a sudden, I lost you there. Okay. Uh, Councilor Scully. A second, sir. I have a motion and a second. If there any, there is no discussion since the consent agenda, we will move to a roll call vote. Ms. Parker. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Councilor DeMott. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. And Councillor Bowles. Yes. Well, thank you, Council. Moving on to item nine, we have no appointments or resignations tonight. Next item is item 10. First item is to hold a public hearing on the request for tonight. And this is on, regarding a preliminary development plan for Quick Trip Store number 4201. At this time, I will turn to the staff. And Mr. Tripp, do we have a staff presentation on this item? Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor. Jacob Kaza from the Community Development Department <clears throat> will be making the presentation. And then there will be a number of staff who are available to support uh, that department uh, as you uh, have questions along the evening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, counselors. My name is Jacob Kaza. I'm a planner with the city's planning division. Next slide, please. As a part of bringing this project before you, a staff agenda memo has been created and tonight's a public hearing has been properly noticed. The agenda memo, its associated attachments, tonight's PowerPoint presentation, and the public notices mailed, posted, and published in the Westminster window are hereby entered into the public record at this time. The posted notices exceeded the minimum quantity and period of posting required. The notices of the public hearing were mailed to 64 property owners and HOAs within 1,000 feet of the parcel under consideration tonight. The new requirement for notice is to notice properties within 500 feet. In accordance with the notice provisions in section 11.5.13a of the Westminster Municipal Code, staff increased the notice area due to the size of the adjacent parcels and right, right of ways. The city has also posted the hearing date and time on its website and the city's newsletter. Next slide, please. Here's a map of the proposed development. The subject property is bordered by Sheridan Boulevard on the east, West 104th Avenue on the south, and the city park complex on the north and west. Quick Trip is proposing to develop a gas station and convenience store on the east side of the property with a portion of the west side available for potential future development. 
Next slide, please. Section 11514 of the Westminster Municipal Code contains 10 criteria that are to be considered when reviewing new preliminary development plans. Criteria one through three require that the PDP conform with the city's comprehensive plan and all city codes, ordinances, and policies. The PDP is of sound, creative, innovative, and efficient planning principles, and any exceptions from city code must be warranted and clearly identified on the PDP. Staff finds that the PDP is not in conformance with a comprehensive plan. The property is designated retail commercial by the comprehensive plan. Under that designation, auto service stations, convenience stores, and drive through facilities are listed as a limited use and may not be allowed in areas that directly abut residential districts, public quasi-public, or institutional uses or public spaces. This property is bordered with public uses on all four sides. The most prominent use, City Park, is a central gathering space for the community, and this property acts as a gateway to that space. The Parks and Recreation Master Plan identifies City Park as the centerpiece of the city's expanding open space and park system. Auto service stations have only been permitted in the retail commercial designation when they are part of a larger multi-tenant commercial center. Since the adoption of the 2013 Comprehensive Plan, Standalone service stations have only been permitted in the service commercial land use designation, which has a purpose statement of this designation accommodates auto-oriented and general commercial uses. Had the subject property been specifically intended for an automobile service land use, then the service commercial designation would have been assigned to the property rather than the retail commercial designation. The comprehensive plan further states, when permitted, such facilities shall use enhanced architectural design standards to be compatible with surrounding uses. Considering the surrounding context, any proposed architectural enhancements to this property, to, to this proposed use, would be inconsequential to address the impacts of this use in this location. In regards to criteria two, staff finds that the PDP does not exhibit the application of sound, creative, innovative, and efficient planning principles when put in context of the location of this site to the adjacent public uses. The applicant is asking for one exception to the retail commercial design guidelines. In their phasing plan, the applicant is requesting to be able to build their gas station in the first phase. A gas station of the proposed configuration is considered a pad site, and per the retail commercial design guidelines, pad sites should not start construction until 50% of the non-pad site construction has begun. Pad sites are defined in the retail commercial design guidelines as freestanding, unconnected buildings. Staff finds that the requested exception is not warranted by virtue of design or special amenities incorporated in the development proposal. Next slide, please. Criteria four through six require that the PDP is compatible and harmonious with existing public and private development in the surrounding area. Provides the development in surrounding areas from protection of potentially adverse influences, and has no significant adverse impacts upon existing or future land uses, nor upon the future development of the immediate area. Staff finds that the PDP is not compatible and harmonious with existing public development in the surrounding area. As further elaborated in the staff analysis on criteria one, this site is directly adjacent to multiple public uses. The architectural form of the proposed uses is not complementary or compatible with the existing public development. In regards to criteria five, staff finds that the PDP does not provide the surrounding areas from potentially adverse influence from within the development. As noted in the staff analysis on criteria one, the site serves as a gateway to an important city public space and the uses and architecture of the proposed uses pose the risk of adverse influence on that public space. Staff also finds that the PDP provides the potential to create significant adverse impacts to existing land uses in the immediate area. Next slide, please. Criteria seven through 10 require that transportation access points are designed in a safe and harmonious manner. The city may require right away or other public lands as a condition of the PDP approval. Performance standards are included that offer a reasonable expectation for future ODPs to meet the Westminster Municipal Code 11515 standards for approval. The applicant is not in default or does not have any outstanding obligations to the city. Staff finds that the proposed access points requested in the PDP are not designed in a safe manner, that they will interrupt the flow of traffic on the streets and that they create a hazard for vehicles and pedestrian traffic. Staff do not support the requested access point on Sheridan Boulevard and one of the access points on West 104th Avenue. In regards to criteria eight, nine, and 10, 
Staff finds that the right-of-way acquisition has not been identified at this point in the development process, that the PDP includes the necessary performance standards, and that the applicant is not in default and has no outstanding, oblig and has no outstanding obligations to the city. Next slide, please. Last week, the applicant team provided two letters to accompany their application for the public hearing tonight. In both of those letters, the applicant asserts that the uses they are requesting tonight were allowed in the 1992 PDP for Hewitt Hahn joint venture. The city still has that 1992 PDP in its record and the permitted use table for the quick trip site referred to as parcel B. On the screen, I have placed a clipping of the use statement and written the first two permitted uses out for clarity. The 1992 PDP permitted uses for parcel B states in A, places for the conduct of any retail business supplying the daily needs of family life as allowed in the B1 zoning district, comma, not of an industrial, comma, manufacturing, comma, or automobile service nature. In line B, places serving food and or beverages where such products are consumed within a building or takeout excluding drive up service. Under line A, the PDP excludes uses of an automobile service nature, which would also be known as a gas station. Under line B, the PDP excludes drive up services for restaurants, restaurants, which is another word for a drive through. It is evident that even in 1992, city staff and the then city council did not support the uses that the applicant is now requesting. Next slide, please. Our city transportation engineer, Heath Klein, would like to respond to the applicant's letter and their comments on the traffic analysis. Heath, if you would join me, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Heath Klein, transportation engineer. And I will be speaking tonight on the transportation engineering concerns with this application. At the PDP level, the traffic analysis typically evaluates the proposed use against what the existing use was and what the anticipated trip generation gain or uh, net loss would be. <clears throat> uh, we do not get into necessarily the fine points of all of safety concerns and the ability of the site to meet the city standards and specifications with regards to these site triangles, road geometry, and other safety improvements or concerns. This detail is typically addressed at the official development plan application. Specifically speaking to safety and accident data, transportation engineering has not supported all of the access points requested by the applicant because we do have concern for the access on Sheridan and with respect to site triangles and the fact that 105th Avenue is actually at the top of the hill. And so to meet the site triangle for this access, the you would need to actually see to the north leg of the 105th intersection leg. And so you cannot see that far. Uh, the applicant also, their letter implies that we have not, or it has addressed safety for these access points and sp speaks to meeting our standards in the traffic report. But the traffic report does not actually speak to meeting any of these safety standards. Uh, there has been in there's been 305 traffic accidents in the last 10 years between the 105th and 104th sections. Uh, so granted, all of these accidents do not occur between the two. They can be approaching 105th or approaching 104th in Sheridan, but we are averaging two and a half accidents a month. This, uh, by adding these use, there is the increased chance of more accidents. Speaking to the site triangle, the City of Westminster Standards and Specifications, Section 618.00, Site Distances, clearly states that for a posted 45 mile an hour zone, we need at least 450 linear feet of clear site. So for the access on 100 or for Sheridan, again, we cannot see that 430 feet because that is actually on the north leg of the 105th intersection. In addition to that, we do have a bus stop that is just on the south side of 105th. And though right now RTD is not running buses on Route 51, 
there is a great chance that they will be doing that again. So this will only further implicate or complicate the uh, access point there. For the 104th access points, <clears throat> this is a posted 40 mile an hour zone. So for if you're going to turn right onto westbound 104th Avenue, we need to see clearly 445 feet. So for their easternmost access, which on their PDP, they're asking for a right in, right out, the site triangle needs to see all the way through and onto essentially the eastern leg of the 104th and Sheridan intersection. So that is going to be kind of difficult, a lot of turning movements, a lot of vehicles there. And there's also a westbound uh, 104th RTD bus stop there as well. So for the Western access point, they are asking that for a full movement. So that would be to allow eastbound 104th Avenue to turn north into their site, as well as a from their site, southbound turning to eastbound 104th Avenue. With that, we need to have uh, a lot, the 530 feet of clear space and <clears throat> To do that, we are going to have to impact that existing landscape median on 104th Avenue. As you all are aware, there is dual lefts for eastbound onto northbound Sheridan. So to get this access point that the applicant is requesting, it would require us to have another access point within 50 feet of the beginning of our dual left turns. So from that point, so if you can visualize where this is at, from the beginning of the right, the left turn lanes, 300 more feet west, we're going to have to clear out that and reconstruct the median to allow this left. And then to meet the site triangle requirements, we are going to have to remove or trim back a lot of the other remaining existing landscape in that median. So essentially, all of the landscape median fronting the city park parking lot all the way to Sheridan will no longer be a landscape media. So uh, then I'll speak to the traffic volumes. So in 1991, in 1996, and in 2017, the city conducted various uh, traffic counts. So in 1991, 104th Avenue, carried 9,200 vehicles per day. In 1996, it nearly doubled to 20,000 vehicles per day. And in 2017, we are seeing 25,000 vehicles a day on 104th in front of this property. On Sheridan Boulevard in 1991, we saw 21,000 vehicles. In 96, it jumped up to 30,000 vehicles. And in 2017, we are seeing an average of 40,000 vehicles a day traveling uh, in along this property frontage on Sheridan. The applicant also at, spoke to the trip generation in the letter and as part of our traffic report. The applicant stated in their letter that the site will generate approximately 2,296 new weekday daily trips to the adjacent roadway. While the word new is correct, is kind of misleading because for especially fuel stations, there's the ability to use passed by trips that also come into your site. So what they didn't necessarily say was that the site will see an increase and 4,000 trips will be coming into or out of this site. So yes, 2,200 are brand new, and the other 2,000 roughly vehicles are vehicles that were already on 104th or already on Sheridan, but coming into the site and leaving the site, there will be 4,000 trips total. So um, they do speak to the uh, past, or sorry, the <clears throat> weekday peak hour trips. So you'll always hear, I speak a lot about our peak hours, so it's when you expect the most volume. So in their letter, they said 83 trips 
in the morning and 139 trips in the evening. But again, that was only brand new. What really will be coming into the site will be 207 trips into and out of the site in the morning and 269 trips into and out of the site in the afternoon. The city requires that if there is a peak hour at an access point that is in excess of 100 vehicles coming into the site, we do require that applicant for that access to construct a right turn lane. And so we need to, we will drill down and get more detail if this project is to move forward. I have another item, the 104th access points. <clears throat> so I kind of mentioned it already, but it will require at least 300 linear feet of the existing median to be removed to construct the right turn lane. And then potentially an additional 200 to 300 feet further west uh, to remove or modify the existing landscaping to meet the site triangles. And it would be located within 50 feet of the existing left turn, uh, the beginning of that. So that is why transportation engineering has supported a right in, right out access for this site, but not the full movement access because of all of the, the concerns that we do have. Comparisons to other fueling stations along the corridor, specifically Sheridan, uh, for this site right now, <clears throat> they have 580 feet of frontage along 104th and then essentially 500 feet of frontage on Sheridan. For the gas state or fueling station at the southwest corner of 112th and Sheridan, they only have one direct access, a right in, right out, 400 feet west of Sheridan. Their full movement is approximately 700 feet south of 112th. And then again at 580 feet west of Sheridan, which is the public right of way of Benton. The fueling station at the northwest corner of 112th and Sheridan has no direct access from the site. They get their access from Benton Street, which is, oops, yeah, sorry. Um, actually, it's 113th Avenue. And um, then uh, they, they get it from the west side too. And then there's a fueling station at the northwest corner of 94th and Sheridan. It too has no direct access to the site and only gets an one full movement access about 230 feet west of Sheridan. Uh, another thing that the city looks into is the future operations of our roadways. <clears throat> and currently the third southbound lane of Sheridan is a right turn lane onto westbound 130 excuse me, 104th Avenue, and it may end up becoming a third southbound through lane with the potential of the city looking to add a right turn lane onto 104th Avenue, or this may can, can be combined as a through and right turn lane in the future. One of the options then, the concerns that we have had is the northbound left onto 104th Avenue, which is what the applicant claims that why you want more access points is because you don't funnel everybody to certain ones. But currently that northbound left under 105th Avenue does have a short queue lane. So we would at the ODP level start to look at, can we modify the existing median there to provide either dual lefts or elongate the queue left, uh, the queue lane for that left turn. And <clears throat> so we're still looking forward to doing that but we haven't completed that kind of analysis. And with that, I look forward to hearing any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Heath. Um, next slide, please. On January 12th, the Planning Commission reviewed this application and voted 4-2-3 to recommend the City Council deny the application. The two reasons stated for the recommendation to deny were the non-compliance with the comprehensive plan and the proposed access points. Next slide, please. Staff finds that a denial of the application would meet the City Council's strategic plan goals of vibrant, inclusive, and engaged community and beautiful and desirable, safe and environmentally responsible city. The city and the applicant hosted an effective neighborhood meeting during the pandemic. During a denial of the application would protect a, valu would protect a valuable public space from adverse impacts. 
Next slide, please. In conclusion, staff finds that the proposed PDP does not meet several of the criteria for approval. Specifically, in criteria one, the PDP is not in compliance with the comprehensive plan designation of retail commercial and its limitations on auto service stations, convenience stores, and drive through facilities that directly abut public uses and public spaces, as further discussed in criteria one. Staff recommends holding a public hearing to review the proposed preliminary development plan and that the City Council deny the proposed PDP with the finding that the PDP does not meet the criteria set forth in Section 11514 of the Westminster Municipal Code. The applicant is with us tonight and has a presentation to share with you as well. Thank you for your attention and there are several staff members with us this evening and we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thanks Jacob. I'll turn first to Council. See if there's any questions at this point from staff or for staff. I'm sorry. Give the council a minute. Jacob, I had a couple of uh, questions. One is go back to the uh, planning commission hearing. You said three people supported this application. What was the basis of their support? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, so. Three, three of the planning commissioners did um, voice support for the application, or in essence, they they voted against the motion to not to recommend denial. Um, I can only recall that two of them actually voiced their concerns. One of them specifically, he said, um, I, "This is just me quoting off the top of my head, and I hope I don't misquote him." But it was along the lines of, "You have two arterial streets. I can't think of a better location to put a gas station." Um, that same uh, commissioner also had some concerns about the access, but he didn't seem to have the concerns about the comprehensive plan. Um, and I cannot recall what if the other two mentioned um, a specific reason why they did why they supported the the, app, the application. All right. And the other one you were talking about uh, earlier in the comp plan that this type of use may be considered or may be denied but i didn't hear the word will or shall can you go back to that sure mr mayor um so that's specifically is the the term may may be allowed or may be denied is because you have the discretionary authority to approve the use or um, not approve the use it's it's up to the city council to city council's discretion to decide that so it's it's not um uh, uh, I'm not sure of the word, but it's not a shall, as you had mentioned. Okay. And the other one is the only people are the comp plan designation for this was last done when? Um, well, last in 2013, it was the retail commercial. I believe that's been consistent since we've had the comp plan in 1997. I can look that up for you, though. Uh, Mr. Mayor and come back. Well, I had a question because of the issue raised that the zoning on this had expired at one time. Can you explain that? Yeah, so the the city code um, requires that PDPs, if an, if, if an official development plan is not submitted and approved within five years um, of the approval date of a PDP, that PDP needs to be resubmitted and re-reviewed at a public hearing before the city council. Um, the reason why we advised the applicant not to resubmit their 1992 PDP is, for one, it doesn't meet a lot of the different city standards, mainly on format. But the second reason is, as I mentioned earlier, this was called Parcel B. Parcel A is also a part of that PDP, and Parcel A is further, further north on um, Sheridan Boulevard at about 108th, 107th, 108th. And it's now owned by the city of Westminster as part of our golf, as part of our city park complex and open space for the creek. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure we may have to ask our legal counsel, but I, I don't think that they could just resubmit a PDP that covers both city property and their property. Um, so we, we came to the conclusion that it made most sense for them to just submit a new PDP with the uses that they, they were requesting. All right. Councilor uh, DeMott. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, you touched on part of what I was going to ask about, and so specifically around zoning. So in 2013, it's retail commercial. Is the do we know with the the current looking at at our future comp plan is this going to be adjusted, or was that the plan for it to be adjusted? Has it? I mean, or has it even been evaluated as what we think that future use of that site would be in staff's view? Yeah, Councillor Demont. Um, so we we have not specifically looked at this as changing. Uh, it's very likely that this will continue on as a similar as a similar retail commercial use. Um, it, it may not have that same term. I know that the uh, long long range planning staff uh, under Principal Planner Andrew Spurgeon is still looking at if we call those designations new names. So it, it'll probably still have something very similar to a retail commercial um, designation as it has now. Okay, and then one other thing I'm curious about. So I'm trying to envision, in and correct me if I'm wrong. What I and this might be for Mr. Klein, uh, when he was describing the the different access points that they were requesting, um, he talked about a, if I understood right, a um, turn in if you're heading east on 104th, and that's why so much of that median had to be. And maybe I misunderstood that that access point. So that's one I'd like to clarify if that's what he was saying, because um, that seems odd to me. But then the other part of that is he also mentioned about if this goes forward, about being able to adjust some of that in the next phase. So with any of those access points, for one, I want clarity on that. And for two, if this moved forward, would there be room in the next phases to adjust those to what staff thinks would be better um, suited access points? So thank you, Councilor DeMont, Heath Klein, Transportation Engineer. So the full movement access that is being requested on 104th Avenue, just to construct a left turn into their site, we will have to modify that existing landscaped median. And <clears throat> typically you have 150 feet of storage, 100 foot taper, and then the 50 foot just wide of the access. So that is why I was saying there'd be 300 feet of that that would need to be removed in order to allow a left turn into their site and a left turn out of the site. The modifications further west would be if we find that there is a site triangle issue. So to safely move from their site and cross not only the two westbound 104th lanes, but also to make sure you're not going right into a platoon of three eastbound uh, lanes that are also getting ready to uh, make the decision to either turn right, go straight, or turn left at the nearby intersection. So you would wanna make sure that every vehicle trying to leave the site would have clear site visibility to any oncoming traffic. So that is why uh, there's a large impact to the existing median on 104th if the full movement access would be constructed. On the, the Sheridan access, 105th and Sheridan is an existing signalized intersection. <clears throat> and so that is where uh, I am asking this developer to put all of the traffic that uh, is northbound, you know, will turn in at that spot. So to accommodate more volume, we may need to modify the existing median there by either getting rid of the, what is kind of the traffic separator uh, nose of the median so that we can gain that seven feet and then try to uh, either skinny a lane or do something else on the, the other northbound lanes in order to allow us to have dual lefts. But that is something that we will have to uh, evaluate it on the, another time and that can move forward and will happen whether they have the three access points as they are asking tonight or if they have the one on 104th which is what staff is proposing transportation engineering staff did that answer your question yeah i, I believe so um one other question i have just 
to understand too. So there you're talking about some substantial changes in all these different mediums from what you're explaining. So, so who, who bears the brunt of that cost? Is that the developer who has to pay for those costs or is that the city that has to pay for those costs? It would be the developer. It is developer driven. And so it, the, the standard policy is that it would be the developer. Okay, uh, that answers all my questions at this time. Councilor Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this might be an off the wall question, but uh, I was just curious because whenever we look at development of any kind, we always ask the question of how does this impact water in our city? Um, so I, I'm just curious, um, cause I, I would assume a lot of water actually goes into a, a gas station. It could be a bad assumption on my part, um, but I just thought I would ask. Um, yeah, Councillor Scully, I don't have a figure of our estimate of how much um, water that they would consume. Um, my understanding is that it is within it is within the amount that we have determined a, a retail commercial development would use. Um, being that they do serve, they're proposing to serve food, quick trips serve food, um, they would have more use than a lot of gas stations that don't because they have the kitchen facilities there. Um, but I don't have a specific figure on how much they would use. Um, my understanding from public works and utilities is that this would be a negligible impact on our water supply. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, the mayor asked my other questions. So I'm good for tonight. Thank you. Councilor Vold. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so we don't have resident public comment in this in this hearing. However, in the public uh, comment portion of the planning commission hearing, I think we did have quite a bit, it looked like, in the minutes. Can someone just, for the record, give me kind of a summary of what the public comment pro, you know, in favor or against was in the uh, Planning Commission hearing? Uh, Councilor Bowles, we do have somebody queued up to speak on behalf of this from the public. Just one person? Uh, one recording and one live. Okay. Did we, so I guess my question is, do we have more than that that spoke either for or against in the planning commission hearing? Yeah, uh, Councillor Vols. So the, the only person who actually spoke during the planning commission hearing um, was in favor of the development. He's the he's a representative of the property owner. Um, the We did not receive, since the posting of the packet, um, or when I have to turn in all the comments, we did not receive any additional public emails or mail regarding this. Um, all of the um, co public comments that we have received have been predominantly through email, which is not untypical for the time of, of the pandemic right now. Um, and I believe there are a mix of comments of support and non-support um, in, in that public comment. If I can also add on to um, that answer, this is Rita McConnell, planning manager. There were eight comments provided via email. Six of them were against the project and the concerns were related to traffic. There was concern about this being the gateway. Uh, there were concerns about it being a scenic corridor and that there were already uh, several gas stations in the area uh, within a mile. And then there were two in support of the project and the comment pertained to uh, being a great company and that they have clean stores and then one of the pros is also um, going to be speaking to you this evening oh, good okay thank you Ms. mccall thank, i appreciate that thank you that's helpful and then so i would just ask if the lower portion of this property is that a wetland? Is that a designated wetland, and or is it in or is it in the hundred-year floodplain? How does that affect the how this development is laid out? Yes. So the portion in the creek bottom, the upper, it's called the Upper Highlands Creek. Um, that is within the hundred-year floodplain. Um, I believe it could be qualified as a designated wetland. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure of that. Um, the requirement from city code is that we don't allow developers to fill the wetland 
Um, so they cannot add any fill to it, or they can't fill the wetland and they can't fill the 100 year floodplain. So their proposed impact is to keep their grading outside of that boundary and to um, maintain no more than a four to one slope and if necessary, add retaining walls to create a more level uh, space for them to build um, a, a gas station on and, and development. Thank you. Councilor Bowles, we didn't hear your last piece. I think I just said thank you. Is that? Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Yeah. Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and and I, I hope this is appropriate to bring this up at, at this time. Uh, it was part of the packet, and there was a, a, a letter in the packet about some historic uh, happenings as part of this this property. And I wanted to uh, see if we can you know confirm some of this information. It was regarding the 1985 Federal Highway Administration funds that were used to widen Sheridan Boulevard. Uh, north and south of of that location at 140 104th and as part of that widening the uh, city agreed to um give up or the the property owner gave up some land in order to secure these accesses um, and then it was reaffirmed again in in 1988 in 1990, I'm wondering if someone from staff could, you know, comment about what what our commitments have been to this, and and you know, the cost of that, or or, or how that works as far as longevity of that. Mr. Frankel, is this one of the items that we would be talking about in the executive session? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yes, um, Ms. Decker and I would be addressing those in our executive session, should we have that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Seymour? That, that was uh, my base question, so I'll save that then for later, the other details. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Smith? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, most of my questions have been answered to this point. Uh, and one that Councillor Seymour just brought up was one of the questions I had uh, in my packet as well. The other, the other is the traffic on Sheridan and 104th. Uh, uh, Mr. Klein, could you walk through those numbers again? I missed from 1991 to 2017. Uh, you were kind of going fairly fast for me to write those down. Could you write, could you uh, let us know about those again? Yes, thank you, Councillor Smith, Heath Klein, transportation engineer. So uh, when I was speaking to the volumes, I will uh, do it again. So there's three, three years that we recorded them, 91, 96, and 17. On the 104th, the, in 1991, there was 9,200 vehicles a day. In 96, there was 20,000 vehicles a day. And in 2017, we recorded 25,000 vehicles a day. And then on Sheridan, in 91, we had 21,000 vehicles a day. In 96, we jumped to 30,000 vehicles a day. And in 2017, we recorded 40,000 vehicles. Thank you very much. That's helpful. I, I got the 100. I must have missed when you said Sheridan, and that's when I lost you. Um, but thank you very much. No um, and just yeah, to note that the Route 51 RT is running, it's just not running past 88. So, yeah, exactly. So I'm still hoping, keeping out hope that it'll, it'll move north again at some point. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much. And I'll just hold off on my questions until we get further along. So, thank you. But staff, do you have anything else you'd like to add at this time? Uh, just a follow up to the question about planning commission comments in support of the proposal. 
uh, one of the commissioners indicated they were supporting the project because um, of the terminology may be allowed, and that would be the discretionary ability to approve it. Um, and then two of the other uh, commissioners mentioned that they supported the quick trip use, but not in this location. And those are the only comments of support we heard. Okay, thank you, Ms. McConnell. Mm -hmm. Council, you have any other questions of staff at this time? We will have the opportunity to return to them after we get the full presentation if need be. This time I will, uh, staff, I don't know if you want to open this up at this point, but uh, I'm gonna move to the applicant and then we will let them uh, do their presentation at this point. And I'm not sure, but I, I will as presume that Ms. White will be representing the applicant. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I have attempted to unmute both my audio and video. Can you hear and see me? Yes, we can. Ms. White, I have a quick question for you. Approximately how many slides and how long will you need? because we're trying to work a bio break in here as well. Understood, I was just gonna ask that question. I might suggest you wanna do it before. I think we have about 20, 25 minutes of presentation and we'll try to be as concise as we can, but um, you may wish to take your break before we start our presentation. All right, I appreciate that, Ms. White. We've had a request for a short bio break uh, since this could be going for a while. It's approximately uh, 8.16. I uh, tried to give you a long enough to go for a while. Let's make this 825. 825, we will resume. So we are in recess until 825. So please take your breaks now.
All right, thank you, Council, for coming back. It's 825. I show all count members are back. Uh, just from a thumbs up, can everyone hear okay? Everybody all right? Okay. Miss White, thank you for your courtesy. We appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through your presentation with no interruptions. So Miss White, welcome and go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor, Council, City staff, and members of the public who might be tuned in this evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this application to you tonight. My name is Carolyn White. I'm land use counsel for the applicant, Quick Trip Corporation. May I have the next slide, please? This is a list of our team and all of these folks are gonna be speaking to you briefly tonight. I will make the introductions and transitions and speak to a couple of the legal criteria. Mike Talcott from Quick Trip is here. He's gonna to speak to you a little bit about Quick Trip itself. Uh, Aaron McLean from Galloway, who did the planning for the site, is gonna to speak to you a little bit about some of the site planning issues. And Curtis Rowe, our traffic engineer from Kimley Horn, will speak to you about the traffic issues. Next slide, please. As has already been described tonight, we request your approval of a PDP for the development of a quick trip at the Northwest corner of 104th and Sheridan. Um, and there's already been some discussion about the previously approved PDP for this site in 1992, the Hewitt Hahn PDP. We'll be referring to that throughout our presentation as well. I won't repeat the summary of what it is here. Before we get started talking about the PDP issues though, I'd like to introduce Mike Talcott to speak to you a little bit about Quick Trip because uh, Quick Trip is relatively new to this area and some of you might not know exactly what it is that's being proposed in this location. So Mike, if you would unmute yourself and your video and um, we can and go to the next slide, please. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, thank you for your time tonight. Um, thank you for the introduction, Carolyn. Um, she's right, we're, we're just coming to Denver, so hopefully some of you guys have heard of this, but I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Quick Trip. Um, 15 years on Fortune's list of 100 best companies to work for in America, and that is an anonymous survey done of our employees. Um, apparently we're doing something right. <laughs> All locations owned and operated by Quick Trip, which were founded in 1958, were still family owned and operated. No, no franchises. Uh, perennially listed in Ford's top 100 privately held companies, we're currently at 29. Each one of our stores creates an average of 22 new jobs per store. Quick Trip has never laid off an employee in the history of our company. Our average store manager earns 100,000 a year, and our entry level assistant manager starts at 50,000. Um, along with that, there actually is for <coughs> the there's, I'm sorry, uh, 401k, uh, profit sharing, paid vacation, paid sick time. You know, it really is a career. And I, I can speak personally from that. I started in the stores 23 years ago and haven't looked back. Uh, Quick Trip contributes 5% of its pro profits to charitable organizations in the community in which we operate. So it stays local. And actually there is a committee of employees that get to decide where that 5% goes. Uh, Quick Trip is a national safe place location for endangered youth. Next slide, please. Uh, safe place. Quick Trip shares a vision of safe neighborhoods and communities. That's why we're partnered with Safe Place. Safe Place is a national nonprofit organization that provides safety for troubled or threatened youth. Since 1991, Quick Trip has been a designated safe place where runaways and at risk youth can come in off the street, receive food and drink, and wait for a volunteer to come and help them. Uh, currently, I think the when I looked it up, the closest safe place is in the south, Colorado, Colorado Springs, I believe. Um, but as part of us coming into the Denver Metro, uh, there'll be endowments set up to bring safe place to the Denver Metro. Next slide, please. Folds of Honor. We're proud to support our military families, employees, and customers. We partner with the Folds of Honor to provide scholarships to the military families in the cities where we operate stores in, commissaries and distribution warehouses. This hits close to home. Um, my oldest is in the Air Force now, so proud to be a part of this. Next slide. Store security. We are committed to providing the very best security features for employees and customers. We're widely considered best in the industry due to the commitment of providing a safe operation. 
Every square inch of QT property will be under video surveillance. Next slide, please. Okay, um, as was mentioned earlier, we have a QT kitchen in the store where we prepare made to order, um, well, many different made to order items. If we go to the next slide, I'll be able to show you some of those. Uh, fresh salads on the left, we have gondolas with fresh fruit cups, healthy snacks. Um, you know, we've really kind of evolved as I think a lot of people have to where it's not the old microwave burrito, microwave sandwich anymore. People want real good food. So we're trying to provide that. Next slide, please. More of the grab and go items. Next slide, please. And these are some of the things made in the kitchen. We've got tacos, uh, barbecue sandwiches, sub sandwiches, and pizzas. Next slide. Um, also, we have uh, some grocery items so that people you know, don't have to actually go to the grocery store. Some, you know, the staples that you, you always seem to run out of at the worst time. So, next slide, please. Uh, we also have an ice vending machine where people can fill coolers um, or ice bags. And I think this is especially appropriate considering how close we are to uh, the athletic fields. Um, as a father of three that have always played club sports, we always needed something. So it'd be nice to have something this convenient. Next slide. Some of the drinks that we offer, fresh brewed teas, top left, frozen drinks and hot cappuccino drinks, top right, bottom left, frozen <laughs> fruit drinks, and then regular coffee bar down on the bottom right as well. Next slide. And I think we're back to Carolyn. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. So as was alluded to earlier, but maybe not explained in a great deal of detail, this use is proposed on a site that has many challenging and unusual characteristics. First of all, as you can see from this graphic, it's not uh, a geometric shape. It's got some curvature, it's got a tail on it. It's not square like a traditional lot would typically be for this type of use. Another extreme challenge is the topography, which was referred to, I think, a little earlier by Councillor Voles when you were asking about the wetlands and the floodplain. But the portion of the site to the south that's closest to 104th is where there is an existing city drainage facility and also the bike trail that runs through there. And there's a significant amount of fall from the north of the site down to the south of the site, from the rec center down to 104th. So there is a great deal of challenge here. And Quick Trip and its team is, is really proud of the fact that they've designed this site in such a way as to uh, overcome those challenges and be in compliance with all of the applicable city codes. Next slide. We're gonna go through and talk about how this proposal meets or exceeds any of the applicable standards in the code and the comp plan and the retail commercial design guidelines. And of course, uh, we must acknowledge that city staff obviously has a different opinion about whether and to, and to what extent this proposal meets those applications, uh, those applicable regulations. And also planning commission ended up disagreeing four to three with our um, opinion that it meets the criteria. Um, I wanna be really clear and make sure council understands that the fact that we happen to disagree with city staff's conclusions doesn't imply that city staff has been anything other than professional, courteous, responsive, and operated with the utmost integrity throughout this process. We just happen to disagree about the conclusion. So please don't mistake our disagreement for anything other than that, a professional and respectful disagreement about how these applicable codes and regulations should be interpreted to this particular application. Um, now, in tonight's hearing, we're going to explain how this proposal meets all of the applicable criteria, including the retail commercial design guidelines, which were alluded to a little bit during the staff presentation with respect to the pad site definition. Next slide. So this is the list of the 10 criteria for approval. I know it's really small. These are the same criteria that um, the staff planner uh, summarized for you in their presentation. Typically in my presentations, as many of you know, I would go through 
criterion by criterion and talk about each of the applicable criterion. But if you look at the totality of the um, all of the criteria, it really, really boils down to four areas in which we disagree with staff. And depending on where you come down on those four areas, that would then drive a finding that it is or isn't compliant with one or more of these criteria. In other words, many of these criteria apply to, to uh, many of the areas where we disagree either fulfill or don't fulfill more than one of the criteria. So rather than go through the criteria point by point, we're gonna talk about the four principal areas of disagreement, which I'll outline for you in just a moment. Next slide. This slide also summarizes the applicable retailed commercial design guidelines. And, and sort of the same explanation I just offered applies to these retail commercial design guidelines. We're gonna focus on the areas where we have a disagreement with staff. Many of the retail commercial design guidelines are quite specific and refer to things that can be determined during the ODP process, but are, which are really not applicable during the PDP process, where you're probably deciding the use and the general outline and configuration of the site, but you're not approving things like architecture, setbacks, landscaping plans, and so on. All of those come later. And that's mostly what is dealt with in the retail commercial design guidelines with a few ex exceptions, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Next slide. Because many of the issues that we are going to talk about deal with this mysterious word compatibility, um, I wanna spend a minute before we get into the criteria talking about compatibility, because this is a criterion and a, and a term that is found throughout your code. It has obviously some subjectivity to it. We've spoken about it before in other presentations. And as council members, you frequently have occasion to analyze the question of whether something is compatible with something else. And so I just wanna remind you that compatibility does not mean the same as. If that were the case, then the only use ever allowed on this parcel would be a rec center. And clearly that's, that's not what's intended by compatibility. Rather, compatibility means when you have two things which are dissimilar, can they function and coexist harmoniously without negatively impacting each other? And that's the definition that I use and that I'm meaning when I say that our proposed use is indeed compatible with the surrounding uses, most notably the one immediately adjacent to the North and West, which is the city rec center and the city park complex. Any other use is separated from the proposed use by Sheridan and 104th and isn't really immediately adjacent. The only immediately adjacent use is the rec center. Um, one of the reasons why we think that this use is compatible with the rec center is um, something that was alluded to by Mr. Talcott just a few moments ago, and that is uh, there are numerous occasions on a daily basis when it would be awfully convenient for the users and patrons of the rec center to be able to avail themselves of the amenities, services, and facilities provided at something like a quick trip, whether that's ice or sports drinks or snacks for the soccer team or what have you. And as you'll see when I show you a slide here in a moment, there isn't another opportunity to purchase those things in close proximity to the rec center. Um, in fact, that is one of the reasons why Quick Trip selected this location in the first place, was that extreme compatibility with the immediately adjacent use and the absence of other competitors providing a comparable service in the vicinity. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Aaron McLean and ask him to walk you through some of the details of the site as depicted in the PDP, and then I'll come back and talk about these areas of disagreement with staff. Hello everyone, good evening council. Appreciate your time again. Um, yeah, you know, just as a, you know, Carolyn pointed out, I just wanna kind of walk through more of the specifics in our um, PDP document and how that really is gonna provide for a um, well-planned ODP. And I just wanna reiterate kind of the purpose again of tonight's action, which is evaluation of the preliminary development plan. You know, as staff reports, it, it is the principal zoning document for the site and establishes the future development parameters in broad terms. Uh, the next phase would be that ODP, which is a detailed plan for development of the site. Um, so with that, you know, we have not actually submitted any um, concrete plans. We've only done that concept levels, uh, which is Carolyn pointed out. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Here again is a concept site plan. Um, with sound site planning, we've, you know, located the site in the northeast corner of the site of the uh, overall property, and this is due to the topographical challenges um, this is surveyed information too that we brought in, so that's, that's pretty well dialed in. 
Uh, next slide, please. The performance standards established within the PD, uh, Quick Trip PDP were crafted in close co co coordination with staff, um, so as to allow for substantial compliance with the retail commercial design guidelines. The intent is that if you know this project were to be approved, that um, there would be a well-planned, high-quality, and aesthetically pleasing development would be allowed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, since staff touched on some of the items in the retail commercial design guidelines that we were not in compliance with, we want to touch on the ones that we are in compliance with. Um, there are many other aspects other than just strictly uh, the use um, of, of that we're proposing tonight. Um, here you can see that you know the project laid out is not considered a strip development. It's not a linear development in any sense, and we are providing a sense of arrival at the primary entry uh, to this development, which we'll show in some coming slides here in a little bit. Uh, the sensitivity is taken into consideration the existing grade and slopes with our design, and preservation of natural site amenities and view corridors along 104th are also preserved. So we go into the next few slides here. I can walk you through on um, you know what how this how these view corridors are preserved. Uh, next slide, please. So this is looking west from 104th at Sheridan. As you can see where the quick trip is located on the northern part of the site, it is preserving that view corridor uh, on that corner of that intersection. And then the next slide too, further demonstrates this from farther back, east on 104th, looking again west, of course. And there in the distance on the right, you can see where uh, the quick trip canopy, which is a low profile, no, no taller than what the building is, um, you know, keeping the low profile of the of the property and the view corridors open. And then finally, the next slide, please. Here's um you know a snip from our um, PDP document. These are the actual performance standards that are being incorporated with this um, document that will be codified. That so that you know are the shells of the development. So with this ODB process that would follow, these are the shells and what we have to comply with. So. For instance, we are complying with the, the sign code of the city of Westminster that will be a shall meet. Um, something that, you know, that we want to really touch on too is that what's kind of brought up in the staff report uh, was, you know, how we're not providing that enhanced um, architectural design. Um, as you can see in the architectural section, with any permitted auto-oriented uses, such as facilities shall use enhanced architectural design. And again, we haven't really provided that level of detail yet. We've gone um, you know, we provided concept drawings, um, kind of stock photos with a uh, quick, quick trips um, portfolio to provide staff an idea of what a quick trip looks like and uh, the high quality of building materials they do use on a standard basis. And obviously, if you can go on Google, you can see all the imagery throughout the country of their buildings and how that does um, really hold true. And then lastly, I think, you know, what we want to point out too is how the landscape palette and architectural walls, um, you know, with the adjacent park facility will be continued over onto this side of the property. Um, you know, there will be a requirement for an eight foot tall wall on the west side of the site to provide that landscape buffering. So that helps with, um, you know, any incompatibility that may be foreseen with uh, staff's perception as we get into an ODP section. Uh, then on to the next slide, please. Here's the rendering at uh, 105th and Sheridan. So this is looking kind of southwest of where the site is located. And if you notice these walls, um, these are the, the same type of architectural garden walls that are being carried over from the property on the north side. So the next slide will show that uh, specific landscape wall and palette. Next slide, please. This is the wall in question here that is on the other side of the property, on the, uh, the street rather. And this, you know, the design theme that we're carrying over and is kind of really codified in our um, PDP document. And then finally, on to the next slide. Uh, this is the building. Again, this is just a stock photo of uh, the basic architectural elevations that the Quick Trip uses, which is a, you know, a, a solid brick and mortar building that continues the building architectural theme around, around 360 degrees. They do provide multiple entrances on their site, so it's not on the building rather. It's not just the one main entrance in the front. They have entrances on the side to help with circulation and really give that um, feel of um, you know, the 360 degree architecture. So, Really, as a summarize, we just wanted to point out that, um, you know, in our performance standards in the PDP, that we will be providing, you know, the shall enhanced architectural design standards, the shall compliance with 
sign code and landscaping sections and and the lighting standards as well would be um, complied with the with city code. So that concludes my section of this presentation. I'd like to turn back over to Carolyn White. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Next slide, please. So I think first and foremost, the most fundamental issue is this question of the use classification. What does the proposed use, what is it classified as? And is this use allowed or should it be allowed in this location? There are a couple issues at play here. One is the question of the previous Hewitt Hahn PDP and its status and what it did and didn't allow. The other is the question of the compliance with the comp plan and the city council's discretion to disallow similar type uses in certain locations under certain circumstances. Um, our interpretation of these things taken together is that this use is or should be allowed in this location. Um, first of all, the, the prior approved Hewitt Hahn PDP did allow all uses allowed in the B1 zoning per city code with a few exceptions carved out as noted by staff earlier in their presentation, which we'll talk about just in a moment. And then if you're looking at compliance with the current comprehensive plan, there is this question of, well, can we then disallow certain uses which otherwise would be allowed when they are located next to public property, uh, quasi-public property, institutional uses, or public space? Um, we understand that it is the city's position that the Hewitt Hahn PDP has expired, which under the city's unique zoning scheme creates the result that there essentially are no uses by right currently allowed on this property, except for certain default uses which are allowed on any parcel in the city when there's no approved PDP. And that would be things like utilities, open space, or single family home. Um, I've already articulated the legal questions that we have about that result in our letter, and I won't go into detail in them here. I, I gather you're going to consult with the city attorney about them as well. But um, leaving that aside, the situation is that there's a real question about what uses, if any, are allowed by right here. And whether you approve this quick trip tonight or not, if I'm, if I'm the current property owner, I'm probably gonna have some real questions for the city about how I can have this property that has no allowed uses by right on it after all this time and after the long history of legal settlements and negotiations that have occurred. Um, but regardless of whether or not it's expired, um, let's talk about this may be limited and may not be allowed in areas that directly abut residential districts. That language from the comprehensive plan comes from the 2013 comprehensive plan, which was approved by the city after the Hewitt Hahn PDP and after the rec center was constructed. There was a question at planning commission about when the rec center was constructed. Somebody said 1997, somebody else said 1990 in the minutes. Um, our research indicates that it was actually 1987, but it doesn't matter. All of those dates are prior to the approval of, um, of the uh, Hewitt Hahn PDP and also of this language in the comp plan, which was approved in 2013. And so that indicates that this decision to allow this type of use in this location has, has been considered by city council previously, even after the records already existed, and determine that there could be circumstances where a use like this would be allowed. Um, staff in their presentation pointed to specific language in the Hewitt Hahn PDP that said, um, and that they quoted it on their slide, I don't have a slide that quotes it, but it's something to the effect of all uses allowed in B1 that provide primary services for daily life except not allowed are uses of an industrial manufacturing or automobile service oriented nature. I looked in the code and I looked in my old copies of the code to try to determine what constitutes a business of an automobile service oriented nature. And I could not find a definition in the Westminster code, current or former. I'm not sure what a business of an auto service oriented nature is in Westminster right now today. Um, I would venture that almost all of the uses allowed in the retail commercial or the service commercial could in some circumstances be classified as uses of an auto service oriented nature. There certainly was a time when fuel sales and automobile repairs and services went hand in hand. And by saying one, you meant both of them combined. 
Um, and so maybe that's what was intended by auto service oriented nature. I'm not sure. And I think the question of drive through maybe is a little clearer, but the principal proposed use on this site is not a drive through. That is proposed as an allowed use on the phase two parcel, but the principal proposed use here is the fuel station and convenience store. And that's what we're really talking about. And certainly this is not a service station, an auto parts store, or anything that is clearly of an auto service oriented nature other than it sells gasoline. So when you take all of those together, it doesn't provide a clear basis for denial. And it doesn't take away the discretion that city council has under this language in the comprehensive plan to decide that this use is in fact compatible in this location. And for some of the reasons that we've already stated and the reasons that we're gonna present here in a moment, we think it is very compatible in this location. May I have the next slide, please? Oh, shoot, it looks like it's shrunk a little bit here. Oh, maybe this is just the vicinity map. Okay, so um, what this slide is intending to show is um, focusing on that language about immediate proximity to public uses and public lands. Um, in the staff report and in the staff presentation this evening, staff was focused on the proximity to the city park complex immediately adjacent to the north and northwest. But I just wanted to point out on this slide that the open space portions of that city park complex, the lake, the ball fields, the trails are separated from the proposed quick trip location by the rec center building itself and by the parking lots. The actual use that is immediately proximate to where the proposed PDP shows the quick trip to be located is actually a building, a very large building. In fact, a freestanding unconnected building, which based on staff's definition would be a pad site. So it is not immediately adjacent to sensitive public uses in the sense of open space and trails in the way that we think that language was intended to reference. Now the next slide, please. Um, in some of the commentary from the public and also in earlier comments um, at the Planning Commission and from staff, although it wasn't brought up tonight, there was some um, questions about the proximity of other convenience stores and fuel stations where these services might be obtained and whether they were you know, closer or farther away. So we just wanted to put into the record this map, which clearly shows that none of them are closer than one mile. All of them are significantly farther than that, the closest one being 1.03 miles. And so when we're talking about the ability for patrons and, and customers of the rec center and users of the trail and bicycle commuters to obtain these types of goods and services, they'd have to travel quite a distance to do so, um, and it wouldn't be anywhere near as convenient. Therefore, this property is actually an ideal location for this proposed use. The proposed location fills a noticeable gap in the immediate trade area for these types of goods and services. This property has remained undeveloped for 50 years since it was annexed to the city, despite numerous potential developments having been proposed on this location. Each proposed uh, use for the property has um, received feedback from staff that it was an unsuitable use in this location. If the city continues to deny all of the proposed uses here, notwithstanding what it uh, is or isn't zoned for and what the history shows, really what you're achieving is functional de facto open space and yet it is not zoned or delineated as open space and certainly no one has purchased this particular open space from the seller, from the property owner, although the city has purchased a great deal of open space from this seller over the years in the past. So for all these reasons on the question of the appropriateness of the use in this location, we asked the city council to find that this is a, an appropriate location for a proposed convenience store and fuel station. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, I also forgot to mention that we have some photographs here of the other existing gas retailers, those four that I just showed you on the prior slide. And um, as we were talking mom a moment ago about the architecture, um, these are uh, you know typical prototypical uh, architectural depictions of these types of stores, whether we're talking about the baseline prototype or a significantly enhanced quick trip prototype that could be constructed on this location, 
it certainly can and would be constructed in a fashion that is um, an improvement over what you see here. Next slide. I'd like to talk now about the second area where we depart from staff in terms of our interpretation, and that has to do with access. And in a moment, I'll introduce Curtis Rowe, our traffic engineer, to speak to some of the more technical aspects. Um, but what I'd like to focus on is maybe more of an overview. On the left on this slide, what you see are the proposed accesses shown in this PDP. On the right, what you see are the proposed accesses which were approved in the Hewitt-Hahn PDP and which were then further approved in a court order dated 1988, which was already referenced earlier. Um, the only one that is being proposed in this PDP that is not part of the prior approvals is the second access off of 104th. So if you look at the two green arrows off of 104th at the bottom of the left-hand side of this slide, the westernmost one to the far left is the same as was originally approved in the Hewitt-Hahn PDP and in the court order. The, the extra one, the new and different one that we're asking for in addition to what was previously approved is the one that is a little bit more to the east that is closer to the intersection. What I'm trying to say here is three of the four accesses we're asking for have already been approved. We're asking for one that is new and different and that is that easternmost 104th access. Um, the, the dialogue was held at the Planning Commission with the um, Deputy City Attorney about the question of what the court order actually says and doesn't say as it relates to the city's ability to approve and disapprove accesses. And as was correctly pointed out by the Deputy City Attorney, and we don't disagree with it, the city cannot contract away its police power. And so even if these accesses were previously approved, you still maintain the right to make decisions based on the public health, safety, and welfare in the proper exercise of your police power. As, as we think the evidence shows, the evidence that's in the record so far, um, there is not sufficient evidence based on the police power, based on the public health, safety, and welfare to deny the PDP based on a proposed traffic access issue. Instead, as our traffic engineer will describe in more detail shortly, the traffic analysis shows that providing more access points actually minimizes conflict, that the proposed accesses are safe, and that the traffic that will be generated by this proposed development is within the capacity of the existing roadways. So um, let me turn now, actually I have one more slide and then let me turn now to Curtis who can speak to this on a more technical level and then I'll come back and, and uh, connect it to the big picture. Next slide, please. This just summarizes in a little bit more detail the previously approved accesses. Next slide. And this is a table comparing the accesses as were previously approved in the original Hewitt Hahn on the far left. Each of the four accesses, three of the four were previously approved in the Hewitt Hahn. The fourth one is the new one that we're additionally asking for. The second column is whether or not it's supported by the traffic study. The third column is included in this PDP. And the fourth column is our interpretation of whether and to what extent the proposed access is supported by staff. Um, I think what I heard tonight is a little different than what I previously thought staff supported. I don't want to mischaracterize staff's position. So if we need clarity on that, by all means, refer to staff as opposed to my attempt to summarize what their position is. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Curtis and ask for the next slide, please. Sounds like Curtis is still muted. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, good evening, members of City Council. I'm Curtis Rowe with Kinley Horn, and we prepared the traffic impact study for this project. I am a professional engineer in Colorado and also a nationally certified professional traffic operations engineer with 26 years of experience. Um, as provided within the traffic impact study, the gas station and the adjacent retail restaurant user would generate 2,296 2 new weekday daily trips, of which 83 
and 139 new trips would occur during the weekday morning and afternoon peak hours, respectively. This makes this a good use with a high proportion of traffic attracted by the existing traffic volume passing by the site. We studied the full traffic volume of both new and pass by traffic at the site driveways. And what we found in our traffic analysis is that the traffic generated by the gas station as well as the adjacent retail restaurant lot will be successfully accommodated on the surrounding street network with plenty of reserved traffic capacity available. This traffic study was submitted to the city. Uh, we received minimal comments and revised the traffic study addressing all city comments as was submitted in June 2020, in which we received no further comments. This traffic study comports with all of the applicable technical requirements and professional standards for a traffic study. The access proposed for the development was appropriately designed with acceptable spacing to meet minimum city standards and provide safe and convenient access without hazards for vehicles or pedestrians. Adequate site distance is always recommended with the accesses to be designed and they will be designed to provide the needed site distance on the roadways. The two right in right out accesses proposed reduce the amount of travel on the surrounding street network and thereby reduce difficult turning movements at other intersections. For example, the Sheridan Parkway right in right out access would reduce the traffic volume that would otherwise be forced to use 105th Avenue to connect with Sheridan Parkway. Minimizing the traffic volume along this 105th Avenue roadway will be a benefit for the existing park and recreational center to the north. Likewise, the Sheridan Parkway right in right out access reduces the amount of southbound left turn traffic at the 104th Avenue stop controlled full movement access. As this movement is more difficult from the turning left at a stop sign along a major street. So minimizing this traffic volume improves the overall safety. Likewise, the 104th Avenue right in right out access providing direct access along westbound 104th Avenue will reduce the amount of entering traffic from instead turning right onto northbound Sheridan Parkway, then having to turn left onto 105th Avenue in the short northbound left turn lane as was described during the staff presentation and then into the site. Other than reducing the amount of travel distance for vehicles on the adjacent streets, which thereby reduces the traffic volume at the adjacent intersections and is safer. The access system proposed also reduces the amount of traffic on 105th Avenue, which provides access to the Park and Recreation Center. I'm happy to answer any additional questions um, that you may have at the appropriate time, and I will now turn the presentation back over to Carolyn White. So um, what I had planned to say, what I had planned to talk about relative to traffic and access was the fact that on the one hand, we have a well-supported and technically correct um, certified and accepted traffic study demonstrating that these accesses are safe and appropriate. And um, although staff did not support those accesses, the feedback we had heard from staff simply indicated that they had concerns. Tonight, for the first time, we learned considerably more about the details around staff's concerns, including this issue of site triangles and some of the other details. Uh, I had planned to say that these vague concerns without more are not sufficient to allow the city to remove or disallow a PDP because, uh, um, you know, with these accesses having previously been adjudicated. Um, given the opportunity, I am confident that the majority of the technical concerns that were identified by staff and raised by staff could be appropriately solved through engineering revisions and amendments, and probably that would happen at the ODP stage. Um, if these accesses and configurations are unsafe, for example, because of site triangles, and it is not a problem which can be solved with engineering, then they are unsafe for any use, not just this proposed use. And they ought not to have been approved in the first instance um, back in 1988 because would have pertained even at that time. The site triangle is the same regardless, the accesses are the same regardless of the use, that hasn't changed. 
Um, there was also some dialogue about the potential need for portions of the median to be deconstructed in the event that a full movement were approved on 104th. And given that that full movement on 104th has been an approved access since 1988, um, it also sort of begs the question about the construction of that median. But I don't disagree that if, these, if this project were to move forward and if those accesses were approved, that any such construction would be at the expense of the applicant. We're not in disagreement about that. The last comment I want to make about traffic is that um, although there were some comments at the Planning Commission about um, the existing traffic volumes in this vicinity along 104th and Sheridan, and the fact um, the traffic engineer from the city testified this evening that traffic volumes in this location have been consistently increasing over time based on the city's recent traffic studies, and um, none of that I think is in dispute. But existing traffic volumes and even existing increasing background traffic volumes is not a basis to deny a proposed new use. Rather, the appropriate question is, what new traffic will the new use generate? And can that new traffic be accommodated within the existing capacity of the roadway or the capacity of the roadway as modified by improvements? If there is so much traffic in the vicinity that no use is allowed there and could ever go there, which wouldn't create a traffic problem, again, it ought not to be designated retail commercial in the first place. Um, the question of whether or not the new traffic generated by this use can be accommodated within the existing capacity has been asked and answered by the traffic study in the affirmative. In our view, that um, addresses the, um, the question of access. Can I get the next slide, please? Reiterating in more detail the accesses we've already spoken about, um, I think you all know where they are at this point. Next slide, please. And then the next issue I wanna talk about relates to project phasing and what is a pad site. One of the other reasons that staff is recommending denial of this application comes from the retail commercial design guidelines. And a portion of those design guidelines are as reproduced on the slide for you and staff quoted them to you earlier. And the question is, um, this has to do with the PUD exception that was requested by Quick Trip as part of this application by Quick Trip because staff recommended that they needed to make that request. In our view, it doesn't actually apply. Um, it, 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 in fact, the PDP doesn't conflict with this portion of the retail design guidelines because there are no pad sites on this proposed development. A pad site, according to the retail design guidelines, parenthetical, is a freestanding, unconnected building. That's not a defined term in the definition section of the Westminster City Code. It's just this parenthetical in the design guidelines. But assuming for a moment that that is the definition that the City of Westminster uses and has historically used, um, a pad, that, that definition, first of all, is in conflict with everything the real estate industry knows and understands about what constitutes a pad site. Next slide, please. Um, here I've quoted for you what, uh, what the real estate industry defines as a pad site. And in order for something to be considered a pad site, it really has to be in front of something else like a shopping center, enclosed or not enclosed, auto-oriented or not oriented, any building in and of itself is not a pad site unless it's part of a larger development that includes another structure that is a larger connected structure of constituting multiple buildings. By this definition, as I mentioned earlier, the rec center itself is probably a pad site. It's a freestanding unconnected building. So is City Hall. I, I have a feeling that's not what was intended here. Rather, when a portion of the project which is secondary to the principal use is proposed, that portion ought not to go first. And I understand why that provision is in the retail design guidelines, because many developers in developing a large shopping center with a number of pad sites would want to develop the pad sites first so they can sell them off and generate cash flow to pay for the development of the rest of the shopping center. That is market and how the industry works and what would be preferred by many developers. And if I'm the city, I understand why I might want to get the main portion of the development first and make sure that the pad sites don't get developed until after that happened. 
But what we're talking about here, the proposed quick trip, the fuel station and convenience store, that is the main development. That's the principal purpose of this project. And the phase two portion of the project that to be developed in the future, if anything, that is the pad site because that is the secondary use, which is not the principal reason for proposing this PDP in the first place. Um, there's also some reference in the staff report talking about how the phase two building to the west in their view will not be a pad site because it will be a multi-tenant building. So um, I didn't see anywhere in the code where a pad site is defined in part by how many tenants it has, but does that mean if the quick trip were to lease out a portion of its building inside to another tenant, to a subtenant, that it would no longer be considered a pad site? And how do we know that that might not happen at some point in the future? My point here is that the definition of pad site that's being used by staff to argue that this is not an appropriate phasing for the development is not appropriate. It's not found in the code anywhere. It's not supported by industry standards. And it's not what was originally intended by the language in the retail design guidelines. And so therefore, it ought not to serve as a basis for denial of this project or of this PDP. The last thing I want to mention about this is even if the proposed quick trip were a pad site, just like the comp plan provides discretion to the city to allow or disallow certain uses in a certain location, the retail design guidelines are guidelines. And they provide discretion to city council to allow deviation from the guidelines where the circumstances justify. And that language is also quoted on this slide here when there are properties with a small size or unusual shape where it's deemed impractical or undesirable to apply the guidelines. I've already described how this particular parcel is very unusual. It's got severe topographical challenges. It may or may not, depending on how the access conversation turns out, have severe access challenges, and it's um, got an unusual shape. As a result, the actual developable portion of this property is very, very small. And about the only thing that could be developed on it is a single freestanding unconnected building similar to what's being proposed here. Whether or not it's a fuel station is another question, but certainly if ever there were a circumstance where a pad site ought to be allowed, this is it. And so for that reason, we ask you to support this PDP, notwithstanding staff's recommendation that the phasing is inconsistent with the retail design guidelines. I said four areas of disagreement. I kind of lumped two of them together, so I've really only described three. One is the allowed use and whether it's allowed in this location that encompasses two separate issues, the access question, and then this last issue about the pad sites. Next slide, please. This is our conclusion. All of the criteria that staff found in the staff report to not be met by this application to find that they're not met, it requires that you agree with staff's interpretation on those three issues, access, appropriateness of the use in this location, and whether or not this is a pad site. If you interpret each of those issues the way we have proposed and described to you tonight, then in fact, all of those criteria for approval of a PDP are met. It is consistent with the comp plan. It is compatible with the surrounding area. It does comply with the requirements in the code and it does meet the retail commercial design guidelines. And so for those reasons, we respectfully request that you approve the PDP. This slide still says recommendation of approval because it's the same slide we used for planning commission. We're asking you to approve the proposed quick trip PDP. And with that, we'll conclude our formal presentation and remind you that anyone on our team is available to answer the questions you may have as your deliberations proceed. Thanks for your time and attention to our presentation this evening. Thank you, Ms. White. Council, I'm gonna to turn to you for questions in just a minute, but uh, Ms. White, if you are your traffic engineer, you don't want to pull up the any slide that shows the intersection of 104th and Sheridan and the proposed inlets into the property. I'll need to rely on staff to do that because we're not driving the PowerPoint. Does that's, this cover it? good, right, we're Yep, good. I'm interested in uh, a question I have to uh, your traffic engineer, you could have him come back. Yes, the question sir, I have is, is, all right, Mr. Rose, appreciate your time. 
yeah. looking at the proposal that Quick Trip has, I'm con uh, concerned about the four way turn, which would be the westmost entrance you're showing along 104th. Based on my observation, that is a fairly close four way turn to what's already existing at the intersection of 104th and Sheridan. You also have a four-way turn at 105th and Sheridan. What's your experience in with, with that many four-way turns into a single property? Yep, no, that's a good question. So full movement access, I think in terms of how the traffic engineers speak, that's what we call those. And so we're able to turn left in left out, right in and right out from those accesses. And so that Western access that's shown on the uh, leftmost uh, graphic there with the green arrows, um, that is a full movement intersection. It's uh, proposed approximately 660 feet um, west of Sheridan, which meets the uh, eight mile spacing for standards for full movement access. Um, it's actually further away from the 104th and Sheridan uh, intersection than 105th and Sheridan is, as you noticed, as you noted. Um, but the traffic analysis considered this access condition. That full movement access proposed on the western edge of the property will function and operate acceptably, uh, given that the uh, site distance and the left turn lane uh, that uh, Mr. Heath Klein talked about uh, would be provided, which we are proposing. And uh, likewise, the signalized full movement intersection of 105th and Sheridan also operates acceptably and accommodates this uh, gas station and adjacent retail building, restaurant building pad user to the to the west. Going back to your uh, staying with that same slide, you're proposing a new right in right out immediately west of 104th and Sheridan before you get to the full turn movement. What would Correct. you what would you tell me that you need two movements where using the full turn movement, you could already do a right in, right out on the west side. Why would you need another right in, right out between the two full movements? What's the advantage? So, so those two right in, right outs um, serving traffic along westbound 104th, the first one, the furthest east, that's about 300 feet from Sheridan. So it meets the minimum spacing from city of Westminster standards. Um, so that, that access there would serve primarily the gas station lot. And then the um, furthest west access would serve the lot to retail uh, restaurant user. And so in terms of that, both accesses, it just spreads the traffic volume over two access points instead of focusing it all at one. Okay. Council, do I have any questions uh, from the council members for the applicant at this time? Ms. White, I'm gonna give them a minute because you presented quite a bit of information there. So, Councillor Smith, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, have we taken into account what that pedestrian bike traffic would look like for access points on 104th? Uh, because I know that that's heavily trafficked by uh, multiple users along that route into the open space. Uh, what does that look like as far as uh, usage with traffic and pedestrian use in and out? Councilor, is that a question for the applicant or for staff? Either. Right now, uh, Ms. Smith, you need to do your staff, or I'm sorry, try to redress what you have for the applicant. And if we need to go back to staff, we will. Okay, then I think that m most of these could be for staff then. Okay, we'll come back to staff in a minute. Let's stick with the questions for the applicant for right now. Mr. Uh, Councilor DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, 
Thank you, Ms. White, for the presentation. Along the same lines as what the mayor was asking about, I'm just I'm just curious, like in looking at this particular slide that's up, you know, there was the three axes that you mentioned were already approved, you know, back in the day. Why the additional one? I mean, what is the 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 business need for that additional one that you guys are requesting? Could you help me understand um that addition? Um, well, I'll attempt to summarize from the business perspective, and, and maybe I can ask Mike Talcott if he wants to speak to it specifically from Quake Trip. I think, you know, as the traffic engineer noted, the idea is that each of those accesses would be principally designed to serve one of the two parcels. So if you were headed to the Quake Trip, you'd probably take your first right. And if you were headed to that other use, you'd probably take your second right. And from a traffic perspective, it was determined that we ought to propose all four of them rather than trying to consolidate those accesses into one because it was concluded that it would be an improvement to distribute the same number of trips over a larger number of accesses, thereby improving safety and reducing the potential conflict at any one of the accesses. But in terms of the business reasons why Quick Trip specifically would want an additional access on 104th, I would need to ask my client to address that with any more detail than what I've already provided. Um, well, <laughs> Carolyn, you covered it very well. Um, just from more convenience in and out of the site. You know, we're we're 58 years of designing C stores, and when we look at it, we kind of know what functions. You know, the 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 first right in right out that we're proposing, which is closest to Sheridan is more of a direct route up to the store. It'll basically dissect between the two uses. You know, and that's where it'd be really easy for people going northbound on Sheridan to take a left and then take a right in there. Um, yes, Mary, you're correct. They could go to the, the farther one on the west, but just from a convenience standpoint and increased flow in and out of the site is why we were asking for the additional one. Great, thank you very much. That's my only question. Councilor Bowles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I have a few questions about, I guess, traffic and access. But first, I'm going to ask about the trail. So I, this is maybe a follow up. This is for the applicant, though, a follow up to um, Councilor Smith's question, maybe. At that corner, you know, there's an underpass under Sheridan Boulevard for, and it's heavily used by bicycles and joggers going to the fitness center, to the open space, or the city park. Where and part of it is you go underneath. And I'm trying to figure out what it, what are your plans for how that comes back up because it's below grade, it's very far below, and you get a trail back up. Will that be the same place it is now, or are we going to change that, or is it gone? If I may, Councilor, I think that the right person to answer your question is probably Mr. McLean related to the site design. If we could ask him to quickly unmute and address that. Um, and to the extent that there's a question in there related to the potential conflict between and pedestrians at those accesses, that might be a Curtis Rowe question. Okay, thank you. Certainly, again, thank you for the question. I uh, appreciate that. We did, you know, have those kinds of plays and thoughts to, to figure out kind of an on-site in, in, um, circulation patterns for pedestrians. Um, on the concept plan, I think we saw on a few slides, we haven't really dialed in pedestrian access on the site. Uh, right now it's just vehicular access. But the uh, the idea is envisioned that, you know, once we kind of do a, a refined grading process is to have that trail connectivity up to the store. You see that first entrance on the eastern side of 104th. The idea is there to have um, a pedestrian connection along that internal circle circulation drive down to the, um, the trail network to connect it there. So there'd be a trail connection north south from the top of the site to the south of the site from the existing trail to the rec center. Correct. Good. Thank you for that answer. And then also, so on that eastern access point, <coughs> excuse me, um, it is a really steep hill. So I travel that way three or four times a week to go to the fitness center to work out. And I know that you, from about that location, you can't see anything over the hill. You know, there is a light at the but it's a very brief light and it's usually and traffic is really uh coming very quickly what i guess my concern would be how safe is that going to be 
for folks coming south on Sheridan Boulevard and someone pulls out of the gas station onto Sheridan heading south, is, are you, I guess, I'm not an engineer, but is that enough space to accommodate traffic hand, traveling that quickly at that speed down a hill where you can't see, at that location you can't see over the hill? Or vice versa, coming down the hill, you would be able to see a car pulling out that location. It, or am I not correct on that? Uh, yes, that's a great question. And Heath uh, Klein brought that up in his presentation too. Um, and you know, when we design these accesses and look in the site design, obviously site distance is a very important measure. Um, all accesses need to be designed appropriately and, and so that they can accommodate safe site distance. And so that will be fully evaluated uh, based upon where that access is located and adjustments will be made if necessary. And okay. would that happen at the ODP stage, Curtis? Yep, when the uh, site plan right. is further developed. Yes, sir. Yep, yes, yes, Carolyn. This is probably a similar question than to the one I just asked, but you know, coming north on Sheridan Boulevard, making the left to the, on 105th, and I think Mr. Klein referenced this, and maybe this is ODP also, but there's only space there for, in the left turn lane for two or three vehicles. Well, obviously there are gonna be a lot more after this development. What are your plans for that left turn lane onto 105th if you're heading north on Sheridan Boulevard? Because right now it's kind of dicey. Sometimes there's only two or three vehicles can then squeeze into there and catch that light. Yep, that's a great question too. That's one of the reasons why we like the accesses along 104th because the accesses along 104th will reduce that northbound left turn volume at 105th and so so one of the mitigations reduce that northbound left turn uh, traffic is to have those accesses along 104th avenue um, otherwise you know the uh, taper that's in there um, for the back-to-back -back left turn lanes for the southbound lefts at 104th as well as the northbound left at 105th can be reduced uh, you have more distance in the taper actually than you do in the northbound left turn lane and so we could look at a median modification if needed for uh, lengthening that northbound left turn lane. Because I'm sure that you know even today, uh, when you have some activity occurring at the rec center, a planned or event or something, you could you probably have issues in that northbound left. I can I can see that you only have room to stack three vehicles in that northbound left turn. Great. Okay. Thank you for that's all the questions I have. Thank you for, and thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. All right, for the council, and I'll bring staff back up in a minute. Do you have any other questions of the applicant now? They will still be available later on if we have other questions, but I'm just trying to get as, as many of your questions answered as we can right now. Jacob, could you and uh, Mr. Klein come back for a minute? I'm gonna go to Councilor Smith first. Let's see if we can get the uh, questions you have answered of uh, staff, and then I'll go to Councilor DeMott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so that was my question. Uh, Councilor Rolls kind of elaborated on it, but have we looked at what that would look like as far as how many people traverse that area back and forth on open space uh, and what that looks like between access of use in the driveways, uh, access points in and out versus people moving east and west on that area? Thank you, Councillor Smith, Heath Klein, Transportation Engineer. We do not have a volume count for pedestrians or bicyclists at this, but that trail is the Farmers Highline uh, Trail, and so it is part of the city's overall trail networks and is highly used and is another reason that uh, Transportation Engineering and City Development staff has expressed concern over the safety and the the number of the access points to serve this site. Yes, the applicant has discussed about spreading the, spreading, I guess, the butter in a way, spreading traffic through all of these different access points, but we're really not talking about that interaction between a bicycle and pedestrian. And with the known fact that we have two bus stops right in this area, that is another reason I, that we have, um, concern for more 
vehicular access points to the site than less. <clears throat> it just, if a bicyclist or pedestrian was using the 104th and you were coming out and trying to look to make sure you're not going to get struck by a car as you're leaving a, this site, you may not be paying attention to the pedestrians. So that is something that we will be paying attention to if this project were to move forward and is one of our main concerns for these additional access points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, you wanna go? Okay, I'm just gonna add to, <laughs> Kempler Vols asked a question about the underpass. So this, this development would not change the underpass or where it, where the underpass essentially joins back up to the grade of the street. Um, their easternmost proposed access point, it would be slightly west of where that trail reconnects to the sidewalk. And so that wouldn't be a changed condition. Essentially what we would see if it, if this was approved and it went forward is they would have two separate private drives or private aisles that would intersect the, the intersect the city trail and then the sidewalk and, and join 104th. And those would have to be designed as, if it was approved as a safe crossing for the trail there. Um, but the underpass would not be affected. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my next question is, uh, if this were just a convenience store and not a gas station, would this have any effect into staff's decision? Yeah, I can answer that, Councillor Smith. Um, it could, it definitely could. The city staff have some concerns specifically about the gas station use. Um, it, it, and if it was a convenience store, I think we would have um, a, 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 a time to think about a different position. That's not, that's not what they're proposing. So that's not essentially what we have done our analysis of. Um, but we, we would, we would accept an application that we believe met the city's comprehensive plan designation for the site. Okay. Okay, that's all my questions thus far. Thank you. Councilor DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and during my question with staff earlier, I was trying to make this point and it, um, I don't know that it really got answered after hearing one of the answers from the applicant. So when Councilor Bowles was asking about people turning left out if they were facing Sheridan. So you're facing east on Sheridan and you turn left onto Sheridan, you're turning southbound into that southbound traffic. So you're going across the, if, if you're to do that or any of those directions, I, I guess my basic question is, would that be addressed in the next phase? So if this goes forward and we are good with the access point, the applicant made it sound like then that in the next phase you would address the actual um, way that traffic can flow in and out of those access points and so that's what i'm really trying to understand because um, i do have some concern around that because i could think of trying to make some of those left-hand turns across those uh, streets could be problematic so i'd like to understand what that process looks like Thank you, Councilor DeMott, Heath Klein, Transportation Engineer. So yes, but at this point right now, this is where the city's pushing back and saying, we feel that they're due to the number of accidents, due to our standards and specs, they're allowing a full movement at 104th does not seem to be the right decision. There's going to be a lot of, to allow left vehicles into the site or from that site is going to be relatively challenging and uh, it could potentially be dangerous. We can look at and evaluate in a future time whether or not we can actually achieve the uh, a safe left turn by making sure nothing is in our site visibility triangles. But at this point right now, I, I don't feel that due to the grades, due to the volumes that we are seeing on the roads and some of the other um, just site constraints, I don't believe that full movement is a safe location to place that. Our standards and specs in section or chapter eight, it's 
are access and then two major arterials. It says private direct access to major arterials shall be permitted only when the property in question has no other reasonable access to the general street system. And at that point, it also goes to say that um, an access shall be limited to right turns only unless it has the potential for signalization. Left turns would not create unreasonable congestion or safety problems and lower the level of service. So <clears throat> I do not see where this is, this full movement access is going to meet that requirement that it doesn't create a more concern with left turns. And <clears throat> our standards and specs say that if, if there's going to be left turns into a private site like this, then it shall be signalized. And I don't believe that Quick Trip has been presenting that they would want to signalize this. Well, and so I, I guess I still am a little confused because if this could be addressed in the next phase of it, is that typical for this to be addressed in the next phase of it? Or what would the typical, uh, in any of one of these kind of developments, if we can address some of those concerns in the next phase, you know, why are they coming up in this phase? Or like, how does that typically work that makes this different that we're, you know, we're talking about it like, okay, if this goes forward, then we can discuss that in the next phase. That's what I'm trying to understand. Yes. Uh, so on the transportation and access, at the PDP level, if we see concerns, we do bring that up and <clears throat> both in the traffic reports and on the PDP, the applicant has been requesting these four access points, the one to 105th, the, the right in, right out on Sheridan, and then the two access points on 104th. The city has always pushed back on the right in, right out on Sheridan and the full movement nature of one of the access points to 104th Avenue. So <clears throat> that is why, why we're here now is because there is a disagreement in whether or not this can move forward. I, I believe the applicant wants to have this set in PDP so that if it doesn't become quick trip and it's another uh, zoning or another applicant and they've already got the PDP that allows all these access points, they don't have to make this argument again in front of Council of Planning Commission. So that is why it's here today, because we have a disagreement on that. But even in that situation, there would still be another bite at the apple, so to speak, as far as how those are actually controlled, because it still would have to go through that second phase of approval. Am I correct with that? That Whether is correct. OK, thank you very much. That's that's what I needed to know. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Smith, then Councillor Voles, and then Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Klein, we do have an access point off 105th near the Tribute Garden, is that correct? Where we have a right, we have all access points, I should say, a right and a left. Uh, how would that be any different than this, what we're talking about at this location, just more east of here? I, I believe we are, uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, the difference between the full movement access to our veteran garden is that is approximately a quarter, if not more, closer to a half mile from the signalized intersections. And so you don't have all the other extra turning movements. So it is almost spaced right between Westminster Boulevard and uh, Sheridan Boulevard. So <clears throat> we, it's not as close. And in our standard specs, we, we really try to limit our number of full movement access points. And then uh, if they require it, we add traffic signals. But uh, to your specific question, that access point is unsignalized, but it is almost halfway between two large signals because there's kind of traffic progression that would allow for a safer left turn into or from the uh, site. Okay. And for the removal of the median that's on 104th, how far back would we remove that median to? I think you said maybe 300 feet. I can't, I can't recall. Um, would you 
said on that removal. So if you could remind me on that, and then if we would remove any of the landscaping, such as the bushes and the trees to provide for sightline, would we allow that for the contractor to, to remove that portion of the median? Yes, so we would have to evaluate that. So currently, uh, the what I was quoting is we would need to remove at a minimum, I believe, 300 feet of the median. And that is providing essentially a 50 foot wide road to safely pass a left turning vehicle into the site and a left vehicle leaving the site. <clears throat> and then we would have our 150 foot storage and then the 100 foot taper. So there's your 300 feet that would just be the left turn. Then we'd need to look and evaluate that site triangle. And as we all are familiar with this intersection, it we're going downhill as, as we keep going further west. So if you're a south facing vehicle wanting to turn onto eastbound 104th Avenue, we're going to need to evaluate, and it may not be the minimum 500, 530 feet for a site triangle to see those eastbound vehicles. We may need to, to go further because, and it just, uh, based on that topography, because we may not even be able to see that vehicle at 530 feet. In addition to that, those landscape medians stand above the existing asphalt at right at about 24 inches tall. So not even including the cr crawling junipers that are there or the existing uh, trees. So it, it could very much impact that existing landscaping on the medians. Okay. And is there any availability for room to add a third lane to each direction at 104th and or on Sheridan. I know Sheridan has CDOT implications as well, but is there any indication for future lanes? So CDOT doesn't have uh, any say on Sheridan north of, uh, at this point, north of US 36. So uh, North Sheridan is all city right of way. But yes, currently we are, I have identified Sheridan Boulevard as being a six lane facility. So three northbound, three southbound lanes. And in this, along their property frontage, we currently have that on Sheridan. For 104th Avenue, right now it is a four lane facility and <clears throat> there hasn't been, uh, a capital improvement project to look to widen it to be three lanes in each direction, but that is always a, a, an opportunity. We are currently going through our transportation and mobility plan that will kind of identify uh, where we have a lot of congestion and potential projects to alleviate some of that. And that may be one of the choices that we are faced with, uh, but we could also be faced with having it as a four lane facility as it is today. And we just have those two westbound lanes. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Klein, in one of the answers you gave to Councillor Smith, I want to clarify what I think I heard. Did you say that the proposed full service turn by the applicant on the west edge of the property was not signalized? That is not signalized. No, they, they have not proposed that to be a signalized intersection, but our standards and specs do say that if uh, it looks, if there's going to be a concern with the left turns, then it needs to be a signalized intersection for private development at that. All right, thank you. Councilor Bowles. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, I, uh, Councilor Smith just asked the same question I was going to, so I've got my answer, so I'm good, thank you. Right. Mayor Pro Tem. And Sounds like uh, Mr. Klein was gonna add something. No, I just know that uh, Council Bowles had asked and had that concern about the uh, right in, right out for uh, Sheridan Boulevard. And yes, that is why I've expressed my concern because the site triangle, just based on uh, just real quick numbers, it looks like we would need to see through the top of the hill in order to, to get that. And so I do have concern whether or not we can safely make that. And yes, I, I use the this road every single day and it does get congested and i still have uh fears that people will exit that and be trying to 
move over the three southbound lanes and then get into the, the two left turn, southbound left turn lanes. And there's not a lot of room to do that, that type of weaving. And so it has been our, our concern and why we support everybody going up to the 105th access if you want to get access onto Sheridan. So thank you. And just really quickly, I just want to say it. Thank you for that follow up. That's I have that same concern. So thank you for uh, that additional information. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I have three pretty quick questions that are all around the criteria specifically. Um, the first of which there was um, kind of an assertion made by the applicant's um, attorney that the definition of compatibility that was used by staff staff was um, the same as the adjacent or abutting property. Um, that's never been my um, experience with staff with land use that you have thought that we have to have a like homogenous, um, all the same land use. But I wanna just verify since that assertion was made, was that the definition staff used or compatible with the adjacent uses? Yeah, Mayor Pro Tem Sites, I can answer that. Jacob Caza, planner for the project. Um, that is not the city's that's not the city's definition of compatible. Uh, we think that there are many uses that could be proposed at the site that would be compatible with the city park complex. Um, this just is one use we believe is not compatible. Thank you. Um, the next question is similar. Um, the um, attorney for the applicant mentioned previous applications that have been declined by the city. I do not see any criteria before us that we would consider that. It seems like we would look at the criteria on this application discreetly. Is that, uh, yeah. am I right? Is that a correct interpretation? That, that's correct, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sites. You're not beholden upon any other applications that may have been denied when you're reviewing this application. Um, and I'll just say I have worked for the city for seven years. Um, in the planning division for five. This is the first development application I've actually ever seen turned in for this property. So uh, while there may have been preliminary conversations with the property owner, um, I have no record that we have denied an, a development application for the, the site, either an ODP or a PDP since that 1992 PDP. So I, other than a preliminary conversation, I don't, there's no record of us, den the city denying a, a, a development here. We have a similar tenure. I've been here seven years and I do not recall um, either. Um, okay, and then my final question is in regards to Councillor DeMont's question. He was asking kind of why we were looking at um, the, the um, access in this stage of it. And it was my understanding because that's one of the criteria that we're required to evaluate tonight is for number seven, streets, driveways, access points, and turning movements are designed in a manner that promotes safe, convenient, and free traffic flow on streets without interruptions and in a manner that creates minimum hazards for vehicles and pedestrians. And so my understanding is that's a threshold question um, that we could get more fine grain later in the ODP process if there is, you know, if it was to go forward because we as a threshold felt it met that, but you as staff recognized there was areas that needed to be improved. Um, that's what the ODP would be, but it would still have to meet at least at this level, that criteria. Isn't that, looking at how we approve, you know, comp plan, PDP, ODP, isn't, it still has to meet number seven. Yeah, yeah, so I can answer that, Mayor Pro Tem Sites, and I'll let Heath, uh, Heath Klein follow up on this. So that is correct. At the PDP stage, we do look at site access and we do look at the impacts of those site access. And it is our staff opinion that if you were to approve this PDP with those proposed accesses, that that is the city council's intent, that those are the, the accesses that staff should pursue for them to be able to use. Yes, we will have to analyze them further and determine how they would actually be built and whether that's actually feasible to build them. Um, but it would put the, a much harder argument on staff to deny them in the future if they are approved on a PDP. And uh, Keith, if you have anything to add, please feel free to um, follow, add on. No, uh, Jacob, you were correct. It, it, that is the way that transportation looks at it. And we are here right now because there was a PDP that had 
said, yes, there's gonna be these points of access. And so we are here again. Thank you very much. Those were my three questions. All right, I'm back to you, Councillor Smith, then Councillor Bowles. Thank you. Just a quick question, uh, Mr. Klein, you had mentioned that the travel uh, on 104th and Sheridan, and you mentioned in 1991 all the way to uh, 2017, are these peak hour cars or just totality in the use of the roadway? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Those are totality. So it is uh, both directions and over a 24 hour period. Okay, do we have those peak hours? I, will, I can't speak to the ones prior to 2017, but I can research the 2017 uh, traffic counts uh, as I know that I was here at the time that we did that. And I believe that through the 24 hour counts, we could pull out the peak hour. That is not okay. something that we just ran as a quick report, but I think I could drill into that detail. Okay, uh, because I, I mean, would we agree, because it was in the applicant's presentation, would we agree that that would be, uh, well, they said that there was 2,296 new trips that would be added. So 83 in the morning, 139 in the evening. Would we concur? Would staff concur with that or? Yes, I, so I, I do concur that their plan development could bring an additional 2,200, 2,300 vehicles to the adjacent roadways. <clears throat> and uh, so with that, you know, we're speaking about 25,000 vehicles on 104th and 40,000 vehicles on Sheridan. So yes, we can absorb another 2,000 vehicles being on those roadways in a 24-hour period. Okay. If you could, if you have those numbers at some point for the AM and peak for the number of trips that are we are currently at, that would be helpful in, I think, our all the overall decision. Councilor Smith, you should probably not expect that those will be before you have to make a decision tonight. Is that something that we can get tonight? It sounded like it was. I, I can I can look into it. Um, I, I don't know. It looks like Curtis may have some information, but uh, just so that we do know, you know, the, the 2300 is for a 24 hour period. And then when uh, the report, they're talking about the 83 and the, um, the other 130 number, those are what will be going into the site that are of those 2300 new trips but also know that those people that weren't planning on going it but you look down as you were driving towards us 36 and you recognize that you needed a to, to fuel then there's additional trips and those were the pass by so really that peak hour number is uh, closer to that 270 in the peak hour evening that would be going into and out of the site. Um, yes, and I do have um, the peak hour volumes if you're interested in those uh, because we did our counts in December of 2019. And so 104th Avenue um, from the counts in December of 2019, there were 1,970 vehicles per hour in the morning peak and 2,410 in the afternoon peak, whereas Sheridan had uh, 2,800 in the morning peak and 3,600 in the afternoon peak. Thank you and so we much. Yep, and we concur uh, with the daily volumes that Mr. Klein stated. Um, our counts showed those same daily volumes for those two roadways too. Great, thank you so much, appreciate it. You're welcome, yes. Is that all of your questions, Councilor Smith? Okay, Mr. Bowles, would you like to wrap up this portion? Yeah, I'll be really, I'll be really quick. So, in criteria number four, compatible and harmonious with the surrounding area. My question is that maybe this isn't appropriate or appropriate for this stage of the game, but we have gasoline and oil, and and so we have right at the base of this site a drainage area that leads directly into uh, Highlands Creek. 
will that is there any concern of environmental contamination for this area meaning the oil and gas from the top of that site draining down to that drainage area and highlands creek is right there is there a concern about that or is that captured in some other way or we can confident that that will be handled in a reasonable way yeah councillor Voles, i can and can answer that question uh, jacob Kaza again um so the specifically the storm water for the whole site would be treated and detained um, in a detention pond facility with water quality um, uh, in there uh, it would ultimately that detention pond would discharge to the upper highlands creek which then leads into big dry creek um, they would be required to uh, design their gas tank system to uh, the state standards, a requirement for an underground storage tank, uh, and they have to follow all the state regulations. That's really not something that the city um, it gets into in the environmental regulations. I think you're right on a point there. There is always a concern that there is, say, a, ta uh, a tanker spills, or for instance, as we know, underground storage tanks sometimes do leak, and there is always the potential for contamination um, on a site. Um, that being said, the technology has been getting better from previous decades. So I think we are definitely as a society, we're in a much better place. But I think you're right. There is still a concern about contamination or potential for contamination. Okay. Yeah, I have that concern. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. All right, Council, do we have any other questions of either the applicant or staff at this point? All right, if not, I'm going to go ahead and turn to the to the public and see what comments we have from them. Ms. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at this time, Mr. William Kearney, um, you are unmuted and may address the city council. Uh, you will have to unmute yourself as well on your end. Kearney, the manager of Pop Perch LLC, who owns the property at 104th and Sheridan. Our family has owned this property for 65 years since 1956. I've been Mr. Carney, we can barely hear you. Can you try to increase your volume or get nearer your speaker? Testing, testing. Can you hear that better? Does that sound better? Does that sound better? Hello. Let's try it again, but I, I, I'm still having a lot of trouble hearing him. Um, uh, can you hear better that way? Is that better? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you see me? Do you really uh, no, sir. We cannot. Good. Ask if you can hear it. But hearing me is the most important part, right? Is that good enough? Yes, the volume's much better. Thank you. Okay. I'll start over. I'm William Carney, manager of Hawk Perch LLC, who owns the property at 104th and Sheridan. Our family has owned this property for 65 years since 1956. I've been working on our family's properties in Westminster since 1978. We developed Legacy Ridge West and owned the properties to the east across Sheridan and to the south across 104th from this site. My letter included in your packet has a typo as the property is at the northwest corner of the intersection, not the northeast corner. The attachments include a number of rule and orders signed by Jefferson County judges and city's attorneys for access points into this and other properties. Martin McCullough was a city attorney in the original case of 82 CV 0994 for the acquisition of the 70 acre park in 1982. He continued as a city attorney for all other cases I attached in 1985 and 1990 for access points. In 1992, the city legal department drafted the letter of intent and the golf course development agreement also in your package. In those agreements, our family donated 86 acres of land the golf course in exchange for zoning on our remaining land, including this site. 
The B1 zoning granted covers the use requested by Quick Trip. Planning staff says the city in the interim has legislated out of their agreement for the zoning by making changes to the comprehensive land use plan first adopted in 1997, almost five years after the zoning was granted. The same retail designation has remained on the site since the first comp plan. Staff cites a 2013 comp plan change as a new standard. It was designated to allow a convenience store with fuel in the Drury Inn Hotel on Church Ranch Boulevard next to 65 acres of open space the city condemned from our family. For this project, the city sold some of the open space to accommodate the development. That did not seem right, especially after Mr. McCullough boasted the city sold it for eight times the price the city paid us. The access points approved by courts and the city legal staff back to 1985 are now being rejected invoking police powers. Nothing at planning commission with the city traffic engineer present or in this agenda memorandum support invoking police powers. The access points have been in place for a long time since the 1985 case. We recognize the city generally has police powers but has not invoked them here. There's no formal item on the agenda to close or restrict an access point pursuant to the city's police powers and no evidence to support doing it. Invoking police power is a serious matter akin to being arrested. It should be only exercised with notice based upon evidence. After the city council open space study session a month ago, the conclusion apparently was this site is now perceived as an extension of the city park recreation center and should be owned by the city. The city has had 39 years to buy it. If the city wants to use this property for its park, I suggest to contact Ms. White and Quick Trip to work out an accommodation to buy out his contract in the same manner the city did with a developer on the 24 acre site on the west side of Sheridan at 108, which is parcel A of the original PDP. Denying Quick Trip at this late hour after 39 years just so the city can acquire it is not right. Quick Trip is a good family company whose operations will enhance the city provide much needed services and clean restrooms for the citizens at this corner. The architecture is not fancy, but very nice. Its exteriors are compatible with the rec center, and it certainly looks as good or better than the city's maintenance facility on the north. City Council is the conscience and moral compass for fairness in Westminster. We ask you approve Quick Trip as an allowed use on this site in accordance with the previously approved agreements and ordinances. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Does the council have any questions of Mr. Uh, Mr. Carney at this time? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Could, could I make could I make one more comment, Mr. Sure. Just, Go right just ahead. based on your discussion. What I, I read, I read all the recommendations from the citizenry, and one that, that keeps getting overlooked was made by John Carpenter, the former uh, director of community development for the city, and he he suggested that that west access point, it, it, if the city could get Quick Trip to allow them to use that to access the city park rec center parking lot. There's where there's where a lot of your traffic issues are. I mean, that's where it's been traditionally. The problem with 105th and the blind uh, height was was that was that happened in 1985 when the the city and the and the residents would not shave those hills. They wouldn't shave the hill at 101st, and now you've got a lifelong problem. I mean, effectively, they've kicked the can down to 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 the city council today, and. Uh, uh, there's no problem with water and sewer. And the only other thing I'd like to see it, have somebody get a real con uh, uh, transcript of the planning commission uh, meeting, because I, I don't understand everything that, that was in the minutes. Thank you. Ms. Parker, who else do you have available? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, the only other um, 
public hearing comment that we have is on a voicemail. Um, and I'll ask Mr. Williams if he would be so kind as to cue that up for us. Hi, uh, my name is Don Fittis. I live at um, 9933 Grove Place here in Westminster. I want to thank you, Mayor, Council members, City Manager, and staff for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm calling to ask that you strongly support the recommendations of City staff and the Planning Commission to reject the proposed quick trip at 104th and Sheridan. This should be one of the easiest votes to cast this year. I'm sure city staff has or will detail the many reasons this location is exceptionally bad for the proposed commercial application. It's my opinion that the average person who drives this intersection would conclude in less time than it takes for the light to turn from red to green that a gas station at this corner makes absolutely no sense. If Quick Trip, an $11 billion company with 850 stores in 11 states, wants a location in Westminster, I'm confident that the city's economic development department would be happy to work with them. Certainly, there is a better option than 104th and Sheridan that would be more economically feasible for all parties. As Quick Trip is a Fortune best company to work for, I would encourage this process to move forward. It could be a good fit for both Quick Trip and the city of Westminster. I would also encourage the city to find a solution for the property at 104th and Sheridan. Open space may be a good choice. In fact, it may be the best choice. Please vote this proposal for a quick trip at 104th and Sheridan down. And let's move forward together. Thank you and be safe. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that no, okay. that concludes all the public hearing comment at this time. All right. So at this point, we've had the opportunity to, to hear from both the staff and the applicant. The council has had opportunity to ask questions. That does not mean that we will not have more uh, later on once we've had a motion made. We've had uh, comments from the public. So at this point, I am going to close the public hearing. And as I de uh, defined earlier, uh, we have had a request for an executive session to confer with our city attorney based upon the letter that we received from Ms. White and the applicant earlier. And at this point, I'm going to turn to Mr. Seymour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to convene an executive session to confer with the city attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice concerning tonight's preliminary development plan application pursuant to Colorado Revised Statutes 24-6-4024B and Sections 1-11-3, C3, and 8 of the Westminster Municipal Code. All right, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DeMont. At this point, I will ask uh, if council is prepared to go into executive session, and I will ask each of you uh, individually so we can record the vote verbally. Councilor DeMott? Yes. Councilor Vold? Yes. Mayor Pro Temp Sites? Yes. Councilor Scully? I'm sorry, Councilor Scully, we didn't get you. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Smith. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. And the mayor as well. It is currently uh, 10 08. Uh, Councilor, you have a, a link that you will need to leave this session for to go to the executive session. We will reconvene there. At this time, we will put this hearing in recess. We will return as soon as possible. Those people who are from the city attorney or staff that need to be in the executive session along with council, if you would please log out of here and then we will move to the executive session and we will reconvene here as quickly as possible. Council, you will need to break out of this session to open a new one and then we'll reconvene in here later.
All right, Miss Parker, are you back with us? Uh, Mayor, this is Abby. I just got a note from her. She's having trouble getting back in. She'll um, just give her okay. and uh, city manager trip one second, please. Yeah, I need to make sure the city attorneys are back as well. I'm back, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, as soon as we know that uh, the city attorney and the city manager are both back, let me know. I see Mr. Tripp's back. Mr. Franklin, let me know when you're back. Am I back in as the speaker? Yes. I'm here as well, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. All right, for the record, it's 11 uh, 12. Uh, the city council is returning from an executive session uh, that we've been receiving guidance from our city attorney. Um, we're back into an open session. We will continue with the agenda uh, tonight with the exception of one item. Item uh, 10C, we will forego for the night. We still have some uh, opportunity. Uh, if there's any city staff or the applicant would like to add at this time, uh, I will keep us on the record. Staff, anything you'd like to add? Mayor, I think I think we're ready to take comment. All right. Ms. White, do you have anything you'd like to add to your testimony from earlier? Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'll just briefly note that on behalf of the applicant, I wanted to let the council know, given the extensive dialogue about some of the technical details related to accesses, if this proposal were otherwise acceptable to council and you were in about well, proceeding with some type of condition of approval that changes the accesses that the applicant would be agreeable to working through the details of that. We didn't really have the opportunity to do so prior to now, but I would just want to put that on the table as a potential option for council's consideration. And what I'm referring to specifically is looking at three accesses instead of four, removing the easternmost one on 104th or taking the westernmost one and making it three quarters. And if those are options which would resolve some of the concerns that council has, the applicant would be agreeable through. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, before we uh, close the hearing and go to the motion, I know the uh, public comment period is, is done. Council, do you have any other comments before we take a motion? All right, seeing none, uh, I will open up the floor. Uh, we will close the public hearing. And we will then move on to an opportunity to item 10A2. And this is a motion for the preliminary development plan. Mayor Pro Tem Sykes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to deny the preliminary development plan for Quick Trip Store number 4201. Is there a second to the motion? Councilor Scully. A second. All right, I have a motion and a second for the application at this time. I will open it up for council comments. Does anyone like to start, Ms. Sykes or Ms. Scully, either one or anyone else? Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I wanna say thank you to um, both the applicant, to our residents who wrote in, um, participated in the um, planning commission uh, hearing, and then also um, participated tonight. Um, I do appreciate Mr. Kearney waiting for so long um, to have 
his his comments um, and also appreciate Mr. Fittis calling in. Um, I have to say I do agree with the staff um, summary of how this does not um, meet our comprehensive plan. So I'm going to go through the criteria um, that led me to my decision. Um, while um, Ms. White made an argument um, that that this plan does in fact um, the criteria, I did not find it compelling. Um, so the first is I do not believe that it is in conformance with the city's comprehensive plan, um, specifically um, the designation of auto service station in that site um, as it is um, directly abutting a, a public um, instant, a public space. Um, so th that was one of the criteria I did not think it met. Um, the second one would be um, the compatible and harmonious with the existing public and private development in the surrounding area. Um, I don't think, it, I, I do think it is a noxious use and I do think that there are other um, uses that um, would be allowable, um, but I think there's a reason this one was specifically um, listed as as being potentially problematic a may um, a may in the uh, language in the in the plan and then finally um, number seven um, I have some really strong concerns about the access points about the um, just traffic in general and the safety of it um, I don't know if those could be alleviated with less access points. Um, obviously, that would be some that wasn't what was proposed to us. It's not what our transportation engineers looked at, but as it is now, I am definitely not comfortable with it. Um, in general, I agree with all of um, staff's um, comments on this um, and will be voting no, or will be voting to deny. Sorry, Councilor Voles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will also be voting to deny and uh, upholding staff's recommendation uh, tonight. Uh, based on the information I've heard at this public hearing, I have a few concerns based on the criteria that we judge these, um, these kind of cases on. For me, uh, number one, especially, um, it does. I do not believe this proposal is in conformance with our comprehensive plan. Number four, I don't believe the project is compatible or harmonious with the surrounding area. I think there are other uses for this for, uh, this property that can be used, but I do not believe this is one of them. And then also then number seven, um, I do not believe access points are designed in a manner that is safe to the traffic flow in that area. So based on those three cri criteria, I will be supporting staff's recommendation and denying the uh, the plan. Thank you. Councilor Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I do want to thank the applicant um, for taking the time to go through this process with us. Um, I appreciate your time and your effort. Um, and I appreciate all the work on behalf of the staff um, and also the Planning Commission, because I know this has been a this has been a lot of work for a lot of different people. So I too will be denying the um, the proposal based on the city's the city staff's recommendation and the planning commission's recommendation specifically because of um, number one planned unit development zoning and the proposed land uses in the associated pdp are in conformance with city's comprehensive plan and all the city codes ordinances and policies i did not find um, again compelling evidence that um, this was within our comp plan and i I do believe that the comp plan has a purpose and that we need to adhere to it. Um, it is our guideline in our city. Um, also for number two, um, I did not find this to be a sound, creative, innovative and efficient planning principle um, for this particular piece of land. Um, and number four, um, I don't believe that this creates a harmonious um, existence for the surrounding area. Um, and then number seven, um, I had real concerns with the um, access and the traffic that would be coming to this area. Um, and so I too will be voting to deny this proposal. Thank you. Councilor DeMott. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. And thank you to the applicant and the staff that have worked on this. My 
One big concern really is number seven in the criteria, which uh, talks about streets, driveways, access points, um, and really the free flow of traffic in, in a, a safe manner. Those additional access points that are in the application here tonight are problematic for me. Um, I think that that's something that um, could be overcome if you resubmit this with something different as far as the access and work with staff to find a, a different way to be able to control the in and out movement into the site. I don't have a problem with the use itself, um, but with those access points the way it is tonight, I would have to um, uphold staff's uh, recommendation to deny. Other comments from council? Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too have no problem with the use. I believe that this is a uh, position. It is a uh, commercial uh, thoroughfare with two large intersecting byways with significant in tra uh, traffic. And that's um, uh, an opportune place to put a commercial uh, uh, building that will generate uh, sales tax to our city and, and help us improve. Um, I too, though, have concern about number seven streets, driveways, access points, and turning movements. Um, I would not be uh, in favor as presented uh, because of that. Um, otherwise, I believe the use is acceptable and meets the criteria and is a, is a nice looking uh, outlay, but uh, I, I couldn't go forward with it um, due to number seven and, and some of the especially four-way access points that have been asked for in this plan. So. Councilor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you to those who have worked on this application process. And going through all of the criteria tonight, uh, the only one that uh, I can really speak to on uh, for not moving this forward is the access points, the streets, driveways, access points, and turning movements in and out of the site. Uh, I don't have a problem with the use. I don't uh, see that as a major uh, problem with this area. And uh, there's not much more to say than um, it's that access point. And it's really the sticky point for me was the most Western uh, full access uh, for four point turns in and out of that. Um, as it stands tonight, I can approve it, uh, but I would be interested in uh, looking at this come to us at a, another time if, the, if there was some availability for changes. So thank you. Other comments, council? From my standpoint, the, the biggest issue I have is what's shown as item seven. Uh, there's there's two particular ones that uh, concern me is one, a full service turn on the west part of uh, 104th that is not protected kind of a traffic signal or any way to control traffic. To me, that left hand turn for northbound Sheridan onto that puts it dead into some potential of a catastrophe of someone getting hit or hurt. The other one is the southbound Sheridan, right in, right out. That again, to me, is a, a problem waiting to happen. Those two particular points are contentions with me with item number seven. Uh, I know that uh, Ms. White indicated that uh, they might be willing to look at those uh, access points and then potentially come back with another submittal. I would not dissuade her not to do that. Uh, as far as some of the other council members have talked about, what's the proposed use on the top of the hill, I'm not particularly against, but what's driving me right now to recommend the denial is those access points and specifically those two. So at this point, those are my comments. If there are no other comments by council, Ms. Parker, this is a roll call vote, if you would please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor DeMott. I'm sorry, Councillor DeMott, I, I didn't hear any audio from you. Can you please repeat? Yeah, I yes. If you let me know if you hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Councillor DeMott votes yes. Mayor Pro Tem sites. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Scully. 
Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. And Mayor Atchison. Yes. The council has voted on a 7-0 for a denial of the application as it is presented tonight. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, this is item 10, I'm sorry, item B1. And Councillor DeMott, I think I've got you. Yep, thank you, Mayor. I move to authorize staff to proceed with the 2021 calendar year purchase of water treatment chemicals through the multiple assembly of procurement official bids from PVS Technologies in the amount not to exceed $550,342 for Ferric Chloride Thatcher Chemical Company in the amount not to exceed $259,200 for aluminum chloride sodium hydrochloride and DPC industries in the amount not to exceed $228,645.75 for caustic soda and aqua ammonia. Councilor DeMott, I only asked you to correct the last number you had. I heard you say $228,645 instead of $48. Oh, sorry about that. $228,648.75. Thank you. And Councillor Scully, I have you up as a second. I second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion by council on item 10B1? Mr. Seymour, I had you in. Was you for a second or did you have a question? It was just for a second. All right, thank you, sir. Hearing no questions or comments or item 10B1, uh, Ms. Parker, this is a roll call vote, please. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. And Councillor DeMott. Yes. All right, thank you. Councillor DeMott, would you take the second part of this? Yes, sir. I move based on the recommendation of the city manager to determine that the public interest will be best be served by authorizing a negotiated purchases from sole source providers as follows. Mississippi Lime Company in the amount not to exceed $190,800 for Lime DPC Industries for Sodium Hydrochloride in the amount not to exceed $315,000.27 and N or SNF uh, Polydyne in the amount not to exceed $191,520 for polymer. Councillor Scully? I second. I have a motion and a second for item 10B2. Are there any comments or questions from council? Being none, Ms. Parker, please roll call on time on item 10B2. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Seymour? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Scully? Yes. Councillor Smith? Yes. Councillor Bowles? Yes. Mayor Atchison? Yes. Councillor DeMott? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Sites? Yes. Thank you, Council. That motion passes on a 7 0 vote. Mr. DeMott, if you would please, the final piece. Yes, sir. I move to authorize the purchase of, of these water treatment chemicals from other sources should the specific vendor listed for each chemical be unable to deliver its uh, specialty product. The total authorized amount of the above water chemical purchases not to exceed $1,735,511.02 in 2021. Councilor Scully? I second. I have a motion and a second for item 10B3. Councilors, any comments or questions? All right, seeing none. Ms. Parker, roll call, please. Councilor Scully. Yes. Councilor Smith. Yes. Councilor Bowles. Yes. Mayor Atchison. Yes. Councilor DeMott. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sites. Yes. And Councilor Seymour. Yes. Thank you, Council. That item 10B3 passes on a 7-0 vote.
As I stated earlier on item 10C, we will forego that item for tonight. That then concludes all of the business we have before the Westminster City Council at this time. However, we will now reconvene ourselves as the Westminster Economic Development Authority to deal with the items that we have with us. Once that item is done, we will be adjourning uh, the public meetings and moving to the last item on our agenda for tonight, the executive session for the acquisition of real property. At this time, I will uh, use the roll call from the previous meeting to confirm that all members of the board of directors are here. At this time, I would ask a member of the board, and that will be board member Bowles, if you would please the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the minutes of the October 26, 2020 meeting as presented. Mr. Seymour. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please uh, approve it by voice vote as an aye or a no. Aye, if you would. Aye. 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 Anyone uh, object? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Moving on to the first item of business for the WIDA board is item 3A. This is an executive director agreement for the uh, service of Murray Dahl Berry and Renal LLP. Uh, I believe it's board member DeMott is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to authorize the executive director to enter into agreement with Murray Dahl Berry and Renaud LLP for work related to the downtown Westminster project in general urban renewal and eminent domain matters in the amount not to exceed $90,000. And then I have uh, Mr. Seymour. Second. Okay, I have comments or questions from uh, Vice Chair Sykes. No, I was in there before Seymour is the second, it's fine. Okay, Miss um, Scully, did you have a comment? I did not, sir. Okay, thank you very much. At this point, this will be a motion to approve the contract as provided by the motion. Miss Parker, if you would please, this is a roll call vote. Chairperson Atchison. Yes. Board member DeMott. Yes. Vice Chairperson Seitz. Yes. Board member Seymour. Yes. Board member Scully. Yes. Board member Smith. Yes. And board member Bowles. Yes. All right, thank you members of the board of directors for the WIDA. This concludes all business that we have before us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we are done with the uh, public portions of our meetings for tonight. We have one item left and that is an executive session. At this time, uh, where is our friendly city attorney? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the executive session that is proposed is to discuss the possible acquisition of real property interests for city open space and instruct negotiators ahead of the upcoming Adams County open space grant funding cycle as authorized by Westminster Municipal Code 1113C2 and Colorado Revised Statute 246. 402, 4A, and E1. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Franklin, thank you. We've had a request to enter into an executive session as defined by the city attorney. Uh, I will poll the council now to make sure that they are prepared to go into executive session. Mayor Pro Tem Seitz. Yes. Councilor DeMott. Yes. Councilor Scully. Yes. Councilor Seymour? Yes. Councilor Voles? Yes. Councilor Smith? Yes. And the mayor as well. And by the clock, it's 1135. We'll ask you to go back to your uh, meeting invites. We have a new uh, link for you for the next executive session. Make sure to log out of this and you will need to be password protected. We will see you at the next meeting. Thank you very much.